from you. Okay, Mayor, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Scott. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is your Edina City Council meeting in the virtual world. Welcome to the February 2nd meeting of the Edina City Council. The meeting is being held electronically to ensure the safety of all residents and staff during the current surge in COVID-19 cases. All members of the City Council, staff and presenters are participating from their homes or offices. And before we begin, there's a few things to cover for those listening in and hoping to participate in portions of the meeting. The city is committed to continuing to receive and hear your input on matters. We've been collecting public input through voicemail and our engagement website, bettertogetheredina.org. It's important for you to know that all public hearing comments are read before we take action. You do not need to submit the same communications in another way. All communications with the council are considered equally, regardless of the way in which they were submitted. Tonight, there's going to be two times when you can call in for comment. Uh, to provide comment via telephone. The first is during community comment. Uh, that portion of the agenda, you're allowed to speak about anything that's not on tonight's agenda or otherwise scheduled for a future public hearing. If you want to call into, uh, into the council during community comment to express a concern with them that uh, meets our guidelines, call 800-374-0221. 800-374-0221. The conference ID is 9533276. 9533276. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Our city manager, Scott Neal, will be the timer. He'll let you know if you go over the three-minute mark. And then we'll treat everybody the same uh, in that fashion by having everybody have three minutes to speak. Um, so, and then the second opportunity uh, to participate will be in a public hearing uh, standpoint, from a public hearing standpoint, we've got one public hearing matter with us uh, for us this evening to deal with. And um, to make sure residents have an opportunity to participate, we will not act on the public hearing matters tonight, or this public hearing matter tonight. The public hearing to collect feedback on proposed expenditures for the 2022 Community Development Block Grant Program will remain open until noon on Monday, February 7th. You can leave a voicemail with your feedback at 952-826-0377 or submit a comment through the form online at bettertogetheredina.org. So thanks in advance for cooperating with us as we work online to conduct this meeting. We're using different software types. We've got almost 20 people participating to make this possible. We hope to be done with these virtual meetings, maybe by the end of February. I think that was our goal originally, but we're gonna do the best we can in the meantime. Um, all right, so having uh, provided that information, let's call the meeting to order. And roll call, please, Clerk Allison. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Councilmember Pierce. Here. Councilmember Staunton. Here. Mayor Hublin. Here. Uh, next matter before us is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, folks. We've got a meeting agenda in front of us this evening. Is there a motion to approve the form of meeting agenda? But let me ask, first of all, uh, Manager Neal or anybody on the council wish to modify the meeting agenda at all? All right. Is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as published? So moved. Second. Member Pierce moves. Member Jackson uh, seconds the approval of the meeting agenda as published. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Clerk Allison. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. We have a form of agenda. Now we're going to go back to community comment. Just a reminder again that the uh, phone number you can call in uh, on is 800-374-0221. Conference ID is 9533-267. 9533-267. An operator will ask for your name and street address. 
To get in a queue to speak, press star one. You'll be given three minutes to speak, as I mentioned earlier. And Director Brennerot will bring you into the council when it's time to uh, make your presentation. So, Director Brennerot, do we have anybody waiting to speak to the council this evening and community comment? Good evening, Mayor Hovland and members of the council. I do not have anyone on the line at this time. However, there is a slight delay in the broadcast, so I would recommend we wait a minute or so before moving on with the agenda. My clock shows that it's 7.07, .07, so I will come back to you at 7.08 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. All right, thank you. It is now 7.08 and I still don't have a caller, so I think it's safe for you to move forward with the agenda. All right, we'll move from community comment to uh, the city manager's response to community comments that were made in the prior meeting. Uh, city Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we had three uh, folks who took, uh, took advantage of community comment at our uh, January 19th meeting. Uh, Britta Ryan uh, asked uh, some questions about an interaction she had with city staff, both in our community health and police departments around some sound issues that were occurring uh, between her neighborhood and Interlock and golf course. Uh, those issues aren't occurring right now because of the of the weather, obviously, but uh, we are aware of them and we have had a discussion with the with the club about those sound issues and they know what our expectations are. I do not expect them to be an issue again this year, uh, although there was uh, some discussion about the fact that some trees have been removed and, and those were normal uh, noise um, mitigation. And uh, so they are hearing more than they used to hear. So we will keep on track. Uh, we'll keep on top of that. Uh, Janie Weston uh, also had a comment that she was disappointed the city did not have a mask mandate and wanted you to reconsider that. Um, that wasn't a question as much as it was a statement. Uh, Lori Groats had two questions. Uh, her first question was, how many cases, how many COVID-19 cases have we had among city staff since the start of the pandemic? And uh, the answer to that in terms of documented cases is 162 cases among city staff. It's about half of our workforce. You know, there, there could be some people in this number that are counted uh, twice, um, because they were, maybe they had it twice. Uh, there are some people, maybe they had it and, and we didn't know, uh, but 162 documented cases. These are people that applied for paid leave, sick leave or COVID uh, leave to be away from work. So that's where the number comes from. There were 32 of them in 2020, uh, 71 of them in 2021 and 60 so far in 2022. Um, we have 79.2% uh, of our of our full time staff and, and extended part time staff um, uh, who are vaccinated right now, and that's probably at the low end of of what we know. There could be there could be folks who have received vaccinations in in a clinic that didn't report it to us. Um, these are folks that we know this number through employee health insurance. So it's it's pretty good, but I would say it's low um, from what we know. The other question she had was, uh, when was the last uh, positive case of, of a city employee? It's hard to say, it could be today. Um, it was certainly yesterday. We have employees that are, are testing pretty regularly, especially when you consider all of the part-time uh, folks that we have working for us uh, all the time. So I'm, I'm guessing we had one today. I think I heard that, um, but certainly it's, it's a pretty regular occurrence in our workforce. 
Um, I think I wanted to take this time too to follow up on some some COVID uh, statistics. And Jennifer, can you raise that PowerPoint? I want to go through some data with you very quickly. So this is some data that we put together today with the help of Bloomington Public Health, and it's just going to give you some comparisons around infections, hospitalizations, and deaths, and some other data around uh, race and age um, in terms of uh, who is getting vaccinated in town. So let's go. Let's go. This is a, a slide. This is a slide we've shown you this before. Uh, the yellow, the big graph, is the seven-day rolling average. Uh, in Edina in terms of infections, new infections per 100,000 population. And you can see that peak, uh, and you can see a similar sort of look in, in the two smaller graphs that are to the right. One of those is Bloomington, one of those is Richfield. We all have pretty similar data. Sometimes we're a little higher, a little lower, but in terms of statistical significance, they're all very similar. But I think what you can see here is that we hit a very high peak very quickly, and it's and it's burning through that very quickly. It's dropping just as quickly. I think it's worth noting that yes, it is dropping, but still those that data that we're picking up even uh, as of this week is still higher than anything we've ever experienced uh, in terms of infections. Let's move on. Uh, this is a this is a graph I think you've seen before. Uh, this one was just a Dyna. The, the rest of these graphs are just a Dyna. We haven't, we didn't show you the other two, but I can tell you that uh, Bloomington and Richfield's graphs look very similar to this. So this is the graph that gives you some data around age and and uh, in cases. So the blue, the the, the blues are younger uh, folks, uh, 19 and under, 20 to 19. You can see that that uh, in previous uh, in previous months they were pretty low. A uh, pretty small part part of our overall new infections, and and uh, in the Omicron area, they are becoming very big um, uh, uh, portions of that total. Next, uh, this is hospitalizations, and and hospitalizations is is a lag indicator for infections, and and death, which is what we're going to show you next, is a lag indicator for hospitalizations, of course. I will note there's a couple of there's a couple of months here where it says that uh, the data has been suppressed for privacy. That means that the numbers those months were so low that it would be feasible for someone to under to know who was included in the data. Their their privacy would be uh, would be not not difficult to uh, trump. So this is why that that is listed the way it is. But you can get a sense of what the hospitalizations are uh, in in January of 2022 uh, compared to uh, the winter of 2021. Uh, hospitalizations are less with Omicron, even though the infections are much much higher. Next, and this is hot, again another hospitalization graph, and this is COVID-19 deaths as as uh, we record them. And this is current up to 20 January of 2020, 2022. Vaccination rates. Uh, this is the, the estimated number of people that with that uh, without any vaccination doses in Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. Estimated number of people ages uh, five plus without any vaccination doses. So these are just a, a giving you a sense of how many unvaccinated people. Uh, we are estimated to have in the respective communities. And Diana's the lowest of these three. And here's some, this is some data around uh, age, um, age groups and infection, excuse me, vaccination information, uh, what complete, uh, what, what uh, uh, groups have various uh, uh, vaccination rates above this. And then the Hennepin County uh, vaccination data by age group is is pretty interesting to see too, and that in our in our 65 plus uh, age range in the county, uh, we have 97% uh, have have had the complete series, so they're fully vaccinated plus a booster. That's a very high number, and even the total population being in the three quarters range, 78% having at least one dose and 73% having the full complete series is is a pretty good number too. 
And that's it. I know council is, is interested in seeing that data from time to time, and we will keep bringing it to you and, and giving you a, a sense of where things are headed uh, at each council meeting. Thank you for that information. Did that prompt any questions, comments from council members? Member Staunton? Yeah, I I just wanted to, thanks for that information, Scott. I, I wanted to think about how we might use that data as we keep receiving it to guide our decisions. And and I don't I don't know what kind of metrics we should use, but I'd be interested as we move along here and figuring out when the data drops to a certain point. When is the right time, for instance, for us to return to meeting in person or, you know, to communicate to the community that there's less risk here and we need to move back. And I know we should be listening to our, you know, local public health experts as well as state and national, but I I really it would really be helpful to me as a as an elected official in this community to to get some guidance regarding metrics on what the trends mean. And I think it's probably more about hospitalizations at this point than about infections. So yeah, I think that's right. Okay. We'll look for that. Other comments, questions by council members? Manager Neal, you might also comment uh, on the uh, vaccination clinic we held last Friday afternoon. Uh, Member Jackson was working there much of the afternoon. Uh, when I was out there checking, she was just going to work. And then when I went out there to get something to eat <laughs> that night uh, at Red River Kitchen, she was still there working. Actually, I, I think she's prepared to give a, a, an update on that experience. Well, it's, that's, this would be a good time to do it. Great. Also, Member Jackson. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it was a really good experience. Um, we had a, one of the staff members from Bloomington Public Health, uh, Amanda, was there, and she was great giving a lot of background on, on what the shots were and what the statistics were. And we had a clinic um, that just ran as smooth as could be. We had four nurses, five nurses, actually, and two administrators. Um, we gave out 105 shots. And mostly it was kids coming in after school. Um, it was really nice to see them come in. Their parents brought them in and, and they got their shots for free and it got registered with the state so that they have um, uh, electronic access to their um, vaccine records as well as their paper. And it was just, it was a great experience and, and really nice to see people uh, taking care of their health. Any questions for Council Member Jackson? I know when I was out there, you know, she gets really enthusiastic. They had to tell her, no, you can't give any vaccinations. <laughs> she was, she wanted to try it. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> but it was, it was fun to talk to people. And we had, um, uh, Bob McElveen was there beforehand and he uh, was like, well, this is a really complicated job. You got to walk people back to the nurses, <laughs> but it was nice. And then we handed out um, masks while we were there too. So it was nice to give people the um, KN95 masks to take home um, so that they were prepared for, for the best uh, health experience they could have. And it was, it was very rewarding. This is all consistent with the decision the council made uh, several weeks ago, and I, um, it caused me to think about whether we wanted to have another vaccination clinic. Oh, was, you know, vaccinating 105 people. Uh, Councilmember Jackson, do you know how many of those were first time uh, recipients, second time full uh, booster? Any I detail around that? Um, you know, we we didn't. I didn't ask a lot of questions, but the people who were talking that I heard, it was mostly boosters. So it was okay. a lot of. Uh, you know, I would say probably two thirds or more were kids um, and they were getting their boosters. So it was uh, it was good. But um, I don't have the full list of where we are handing out masks. But Manager Neal, do you have that information? I, I do. I need to I need to find it, but I'll share that okay. later in the meeting. OK. Yep. Yeah. So I've got um, at the let's see for mask distribution at the clubhouse, three common bond housing complexes. 66 West, Edina Senior Center, 
7500 York Cooperative and at the lab uh, city licensed food establishments for the staff. So that's what I've got from Jeff Brown. And, and, and that's I what that. I that's what I have too. And, okay. And we would the only add I know to that is Braemar Arena. We're going okay. to have a, a some at the arena as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting them out into people's hands and they're nice sturdy masks. We've got 18,000 of them. So we want to get them out to people and get them used. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Jackson, thanks for doing that volunteer work. Yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, nice to see you working out there. Yeah. Um, all right, next we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. There are several items on the consent agenda. Does anyone on the council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? I'm gonna comment on a couple of them that are particularly significant, but I think we could handle them in a single motion. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda in its entirety or as shown? So moved. Second. Member Anderson moves. Member Staunton seconds uh, approval of the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Clerk Allison. Um, Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. We have a consent agenda. Um, I think one of the things Manager Neal is going to talk about uh, a little bit later on is um, some suggested improvements he wants to make uh, or have us consider structurally on the agenda. Uh, one of them would involve gifts like we just, one of those changes would involve gifts like we have uh, received from Pacey Irk and the Bjornis family. Uh, Pacey Irk, a lifetime resident of Edina, uh, just a wonderful human being. Spends, uh, spent a lot of her younger years teaching and working at Braemar in the summertime, is still a really active member out at uh, Braemar. And uh, don't ever play golf with her for money. She'll clean your clock um, or play her uh, just straight up. You know, don't. Uh, she's just a wonderful athlete on top of everything else, but uh, a heart that you can't believe uh, for the city of Edina. And she has donated uh, sufficient funding to put a, a clock out at Braemar. And I'm assuming it's gonna be something similar to what we have out in front of the uh, of the Centrum, the Hughes Centrum yep. down at Centennial Lakes where the, we've got that rotary sponsored clock. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. And so Pacey is sponsoring that out at Braemar. And then the Bjornis family is doing some uh, improvements around a park that's near to their home. And again, a really significant donation of $35,000. So thanks to those those folks. Thanks to Pacey and thanks to the Bjornis family for the those wonderful gifts. Um, all right, we've got one public hearing matter this evening, and that is um, involving the uh, Hennepin County Community, uh, Community Development Block Grant Program recommended funding uh, expenditures and Stephanie Hawkinson, our affordable housing development manager has this matter. Good evening. Thank you. Um, yes, this is um, pertaining to our annual allocation of block grant funds that um, originate at Washington with um, the feds and then go to Hennepin County. Um, I will share my screen. It's up now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I can get my page down to work. Okay, excuse me. Um, so this year, the estimated allocation, and we won't know until um, the federal government makes their final decision, but we have to get the approvals in early. We estimate that Edina's allocation is $176,472, of which 85% or $150,001 um, is being discussed this evening. The 15%, the public service portion, stays with the county and representatives from all the cities um, get together and we review applications to determine where, you know, we each have our 15% where um, they will get allocated. 
So instead of uh, an organization needing to have six different contracts, they'll have one contract with the county. So the county administers these funds. Over the years, I just throw this in to see how our block grant allocation has changed. And since 1992, not much. Um, it dipped a little bit in the early teens of um, like 2012 was probably the lowest, and it's been creeping up a little bit since then. But relatively speaking, it stayed fairly flat, even though our population has grown. We did get a bump last year, and one of the variables that um, was related to that bump was due to an increase of overcrowding by residents in the city. This is supposed to be 2022. I apologize for the heading. I, it's only February, so I have a few more months to get used to the new year. Um, again, the public service portion is about $26,000, and that will stay with the county. And then our portion that we are deciding on tonight is about $150 and $1. And I am proposing, similar to last year, that $90,000 and $1 goes to the West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust Homes Within Reach program, and 60,000 stays with Hennepin County for a housing rehab program. So you, I think, have become familiar with um, the Affordable Housing Land Trust. We have augmented our block grant allocation this past year, and it has been very successful but they still do rely on these block grant funds. This year, for instance, they acquired five homes. Two of the homes were with the separate allocation that was just Edina money, uh, um, excuse me, three of the homes, and two of the homes were using the block grant money mixed with funds from the state, from the county, and other sources. So they still do use these funds and they are necessary for their program. They did request $100,000 this year and I am proposing $90,000 in part because we have provided them with other funding sources. So this chart shows where Walt and Homes Within Reach works um, in all the different cities. And it is three people at their organization that are working in all these different cities. So we, we alone have kept them fairly busy. But more importantly, as you can see with the median house prices, the $90,000 in and of itself clearly is not going to be enough to buy and rehab a home. It will be combined with other sources of funds. In the past, they've had to use two years of our block grant allocation in order to be able to complete one home. Since we have awarded them additional funds through um, our affordable housing trust fund program, um, they, can, they can combine them. But uh, the median price of home in Edina in 2021 was, um, according to this chart, was $585 where in other communities such as Crystal, it's 280, um, Golden Valley, 385, et cetera. So the change from 2017 in Edina, the, price, um, the cost of a home has increased 27%. The second aspect of this request is for the $60,000 to stay with the Hennepin County to um, for a housing rehab program. Again, we also have a housing rehab program that is funded with our trust fund monies. Um, our program is structured a little different. It goes up to 120% of area median income. The county's is, goes up to 80% of area median income, so it's more deeply affordable. It is forgiven after 15 years. There is a waiting list um, for these funds. We allocated $60,000 last year. There are about eight people on the waiting list currently, and um, most of all, people that apply towards this funding source are seniors. So, 
Oh, I apologize. I didn't change the dates on this either. I got March and February mixed up. The public um, BTE will close on the 7th. And then a final decision at the February 15th meeting. I had the wrong month on which the meeting was changed. So that's it, if there are any questions. Questions for uh, Director Hawkinson? I've got a question, Your Honor. Yes, Member Jackson. Yeah, so Director Hawkinson, with the 15% that stays with the county, and let me just see if I've got this correct, that then the cities say have a voice in where that money goes, but it, it's the county holds it to get the cost of um, of the RFP process and everything to keep that cost down. But then once those uh, contracts are decided, does the money come back into Edina? Mayor, council members, no. Um, the Hennepin County deals with all the contracting, all the money distribution, all the reporting, all the paperwork. What we do when we get together, when all the cities get together to decide on where the funds will go, we look at a geographic distribution. So um, if there are a lot of nonprofits in Brooklyn Center and Brooklyn Park and they deal primarily or only in those two cities, we do make sure that there are others represented that get funding that um, serve Edina and Richfield and St. Louis Park. So we, we do look at distribution of where the funds are going and that every city is represented. Thank you. Other questions for Manager Hawkinson? Manager Hawkinson, uh, we've seen a lot of activity at the federal government level with respect to um, uh, funding levels on, on different projects uh, or different uh, purposes, whether it's an infrastructure bill or a Build Back Better bill is being proposed. Um, if we receive a more significant amount of money than what we're anticipating, would you be recommending uh, again to us uh, how that money be allocated? Uh, and would you recommend uh, in that circumstance that the percentages remain relatively the same? Mayor, council members, what has happened um, in the past years is we did get a little bit more than what was estimated at this time. And then we would take um, the increase and in, yes, split it off proportionally to the two um, entities or the two programs that are getting funded. I have not heard that there would be a significant increase in block grant funds um, where I would call for me to come back to you to say, oh, well, we're getting like four times as much money. That, let's think of different types of programs. It's usually fairly small, the increase, and I believe that that is still going to be true this year. The new funding seems to be special programs like through ARP and other types of special funding programs. Okay. To segue off of uh, Member Jackson's question, I thought we used to have in Edina a program for home rehabilitation that we, that we handled specifically through the city. Do we still have that, that um, entity? Mayor, council members, we do. There was a time when that 15% was distributed directly by the city, but they realized that was a really inefficient process because it was such a small amount of money coming from multiple different sources and you can't do that much with that little bit of money. Um, so at one point we did administer it. Um, However, last year, you all, the HRA did approve up to a million dollars that's being administered by CEE for a home rehab program that does go up to 120% of area median income. And thus far, I believe we have about 30 applications through that process, and over 50% of the funds have been allocated of that million dollars. So we do have a slightly different rehab program that is also doing well. Uh, if the council so choose, chose, could we uh, choose to uh, take that recommendation of yours on the rehabilitation of private property at 60000 and allocate it to just specifically Adina projects? 
That is just, um, Mayor Councilmember, that 60000 is just for Edina Projects. All right. Well, it, says that in your it, note, it said in your note it was facilitated by Hennepin County, and maybe I made an incorrect assumption when I read the word facilitated. Uh, Mayor, council members, it is administered. They do all the purple pipe okay. for work, but all the homes, all the dollars are spent in Edina. Okay, good. Thanks for that clarification. That was helpful. And you may have said that earlier, and I was thinking about the uh, something else or thinking about the agenda here. So thanks for that. Other questions from council members? All right, folks, if you're listening in and you're interested in testifying regarding uh, the potential use of these CDBG block grant funds, this is your chance to call in 800-374-0221. Conference ID number is 9533276. 9533276. Again, 800-374-0221. Give the operator your name and address, and then you'll press uh, star one to get in the queue. And Director Benerat will bring you in to speak to the council. Director Benerat, I'll turn now to you to see if we have anybody waiting to speak to the council. I do not have anyone on the call at this time. Again, because of the delay, I would recommend we wait a minute before moving on. My clock shows that it's 7.37, so I will come, just turn to 7.38, so I will come back to you at 7.39 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. All right, thank you. It is now 7.39 and I do not have any other callers, so I think it's safe for you to move on with the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to this matter, uh, colleagues, is there a motion to close the public hearing at noon on February 7th, 2022 and continue the action on these item, uh, this item to the February 15, 2022 City Council meeting? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves, Member Pierce seconds. The motion is stated. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Mayor Hufflin. Aye. The uh, potential determination by the uh, City Council on the CDBG uh, block grant funds uh, the matter will be held open for further public input until noon on February 7, 2022. And then we will make a decision on the recommendation from staff on how to use these funds on February 15, 2022. Thanks, everybody. Uh, motion passes. Now we're going to move on to the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda. We've got two matters in front of us this evening. One involves some potential sound wall improvements. Uh, embodied in resolution 2022-15. There's actually two segments of this, a north phase and a south phase. Uh, Director Milner is going to take this matter on, and then we've also got a sketch plan review. But let's first take on resolution 2022-15, which is uh, the matter that will be presented to us by Director Milner. Mr. Mayor. Yes. It's reminding you that I'm going to recuse myself on this item. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, thanks for the inter introduction for the noise wall improvements on Highway 169. Uh, we can start the open or uh, the public hearing at the last council meeting, and I'll provide an update on what we heard. Just to reorientate yourselves with the projects, there is two locations. I would say one's called the North Wall, and that's north of Highway 62 along Lincoln Drive, and then the South Wall, a reference. And that's south of Highway 62 and north of Valley View Road there with that uh, uh, longer red arrow there. 
So in discussions with MnDOT, we can separate this project into or these this resolution or this uh, these wall projects into two separate projects. You could approve or not approve either one of these two projects uh, with separate motions. And with Council Member Stott and Knight participating, since there's assessments of on this project or these projects, we need four of four participating members to approve. So what did we hear? Uh, on the north wall uh, in 2018, we did receive some comments from the Manor Homes and the Loden. That was four years ago, so I don't know how much you want to stake you want to take in those comments. So in 2022, we heard four online comments. One was supportive, three against, including the Loden. And there was a pretty strong legal letter question from the Loden. And recall, they were funding about 72% of the project. On the south wall, we had a lot of uh, phone comments during the public hearing at the last council meeting. All were supportive. And we received 11 online comments. And only two were against uh, the project. So really a strong resounding support for that south wall. So with, all, with the lack of positive comments and uh, that legal letter from the Loden's management team and owners, staff is not going to recommend approval of the north wall. Uh, I hate doing that because MnDOT does not do very many metro area walls. So I really don't like when we don't approve and don't use that funding by the Department of Transportation. So we know there's limited support based on the comments and then that legal concern that I will not be recommending that wall here tonight. The south wall, much different case. We got a lot of positive comments and support for that one. If you wanted to go into the details, they're shown here with those different tiers, different decibel reductions and the cost per tier ranging from $2,100 to $5,900 for that first tier right along the highway. So I'll, I'll recommend approval of the south wall project only. I would recommend denial of that north wall project. And I think it's important that council makes that form, um, makes a recommendation on both one way or the other, just so MnDOT has record of that. We did provide a re revised resolution in the packet that 2022-15 in that resolution, it only states the approval of the south wall only. So I'll stand for any questions at this point. Questions for Director Milner, Council Members? Council Member Jackson? Oh, I mean, excuse me, Council Member Pierce. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, ju I just had a, a, a general question. The feedback from the load and um, was, I, I think, like, as you said, pretty direct. Um, I was wondering if it's our policy, our procedure, I shouldn't say policy, that we would look into some of the legal, that legal challenge to understand it better. Um, have we done that? Is it our intent to? If we have, what did we find out? Um, so just in general, just some feedback on that. Yeah, thanks, Councilmember Pierce. Great question. So we, we did. I discussed with City Attorney Kendall uh, whether or not we could support the assessments for noise reductions, and he could maybe state, but his opinion was we could. And then I also called the appraiser we, we, we use for our street reconstruction process that does those benefit letters. And he reviewed our assessments and felt like we could justify justify those benefits. But in either case, it would be it could be a tough legal fight. So is it worth the lift uh, to get this project approved when there really isn't any uh, public support for it. So I see Attorney Kendall turn his uh, camera on. Mr. Kendall, do you want to add anything to that question? Member Pierce, members of the council, uh, that's an accurate summary. Um, it's it's possible a legal case could go either way. I'm, I'm not all certain that they would prevail, but uh, there would be some time and money spent in litigation. So it's just a question of whether the city wants to take that on or just uh, take them at their word regarding their feelings about the project. Uh, the city could choose to build a project and could assess for that and could go to court and litigate the validity of those assessments and could prevail. So uh, I'm not saying that the city cannot do it. I'm just saying that there may be some cost and risk involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Pierce. Other questions from council members? 
Maybe we could take care of this, the south uh, wall first, as you characterize it, which is embodied in resolution 2022-15. And that's SA21 is the project designation. And if that resolution passes, that would approve the noise wall uh, construction from uh, northbound Valley View Road to Apache Road, as I understand it. Is that correct, Director Milner? That's correct. All right. Is there uh, a council member that would make that motion so we can have a discussion on that? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Anderson seconds the passage of resolution 20-22-15, which uh, deals with uh, project designated SA-21, which is the uh, proposed wall for the south portion of the overall project from northbound Valley View Road to Apache Road. Uh, discussion amongst council members, comments from council members? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Member Jackson. I, I was just so moved by the fact that this would not only uh, reduce the sound, but make that safer. And and I was really pleased to hear from the neighbors um, saying that. So I think this is a really good thing for the neighborhood. Other comments? In this particular aspect of the project? I, I too was uh, uh, really taken with the comments we had at the at the public hearing from some of the neighbors that have taken some time to analyze this matter, had lived there a long period of time. And um, at least one of them, I wasn't certain which way they were gonna move on it, but they were very supportive at the end of the day. And uh, I know from living in a neighborhood um, close to Highway 100 at one point in time where you, you not only get the reduction in, in noise volume, uh, you get more safety out of it, and then you get the you know, get rid of the visual uh, sight of the cars. And that alone, not seeing them going by, even though you can still hear it a little bit, is a, is a big improvement. So I, I would be supportive of this particular resolution. Um, Member Anderson, any comment? Otherwise, we could certainly um, move to a to a vote. I think that uh, Mr. Mayor, you and uh, Council Member Jackson have summarized it very nicely. But thank you. We've got a motion and a second to approve resolution number 20-22-15, which is SA-21, the south wall portion of the proposed project running from northbound Valley View to Apache Road. Uh, hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Clerk Allison. Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Councilmember Jackson? Aye. Councilmember Pierce? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. The motion passes. That portion of the project is approved. Uh, with respect to the request from Director Milner on uh, denial on SA-22, is there a motion to that effect? So no. moved. Second. Member Pierce moves. Member Jackson seconds. Uh, the motion to deny that portion of the noise proposed noise wall improvement that was embodied in project designated SA-22. Any further discussion there? Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, and actually this is for uh, Director Milner. So um, I'm, I'm recalling that MnDOT funds 90% of the project. Is that accurate? That is correct. Yeah. So, and it's an expensive construction. So right. what, if we, if we decide to um, deny that tonight, then we lose the value and the residual value to the immediate neighborhood, including the load. And I understand their objection. We all read the letter very carefully. So it, it just occurs to me as we go through it that the same benefits exist on the north side as do exist on the south side. We embrace those benefits, and and we now say, well, we if, if, if the potential of litigation based on the letter that we received is tangible, and can we prevail? Uh, the city attorney says mm, potentially, um, and I think that we're dealing with uh, state statute 429, and so the 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 value of the special benefit that's brought to the surrounding properties is is really that's. That's the potential for litigation. So here we are, and we say we're going to deny 90% of what, what would be the approximate total cost of the project, Director? 
Uh, the total project costs about 1.2 million. The assessments is going to cover about just 165,000. So there's probably a 900,000 dollar or so benefit for the city to participate. Well, um, like you, I, I sure hate to be in the position of saying, no, we don't need that. We don't need to benefit from the wall on the basis that there could be litigation. I don't like litigation. Who does? I, I, I it, it's it, to me, this is. Um, we're really rejecting a significant benefit and um, we I, I, I think maybe other council members want to comment on this, but it's troubling to me. Thank you, Member Anderson. Those are those are excellent comments. Uh, Council Member Jackson. Um, yes, I think you know we're rejecting nine hundred thousand dollars spent in our community. Um, the Loden did say that it wasn't just the cost that they were challenging; they were also challenging the marketing, the loss of marketing from the highway, um, which is not included in how the assessment is made. So I thought it was a more complex argument that they were making other than just the sheer value. So they were losing um, a different type of value other than just the, the cost of the, you know, the improvement on the sound. So I thought it was more complex than just um, what it would be listed in the assessment. Any observations there, Director Milner? Or uh, Mr. Kendall, I guess, actually would be more appropriate. Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, it's thank just you. It's uh, just not the assessed value. It's the uh, loss of, I mean, do they have a right to a view, I guess, is one thing. Do they have the right to that um, that ability to market themselves to the general public by being visible to a, a highway? Oh, Mr. Mayor, there's a, a difference between a situation where there is a taking from the property by eminent domain as opposed to simply an assessment for an improvement within the right of way. So the city does have the ability to, and MnDOT, do have the ability to operate within the right of way and, and construct sound walls within the right of way. And uh, the Loden would have no ability to argue for damages based on that unless there was a taking from their property. Um, but I still do anticipate they would try to argue that the, that should be offset against the benefits. Um, I'm not sure that argument would prevail. Uh, so I think you really have to limit your analysis to uh, a benefit analysis rather than a damages analysis. I know this is a little, little technical, but um, I, I think they would probably they would try to argue damages. I technically, if, from a legal standpoint, uh, they should not be successful in that argument. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Well, I guess. My comment wasn't based on a purely legal argument, I guess. I, I, I am a little troubled imposing something, what we view as a benefit on somebody who doesn't want it. And that's that to me is, is more um, representing. So yes, Mr. Uh, Manager Neal. Well, I, I would just add to that. I think in the case of, of if we if we would go forward with this and and avail ourselves of nine hundred thousand dollars of value from MnDOT, we have to net out against that the money that we would spend on litigation because they will they will litigate. I, I don't have any. Uh, I don't. I, I'm I'm sure. I don't have any doubt about that. They would litigate. So even if we would get nine hundred thousand dollars of value from this wall as a community. There's going to be a cost of that, and it's likely to be a six figure cost uh, in terms of what it would cost us to impose that wall on on a property owner that doesn't want it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, the um, only question I have is what are, are there other options or alternatives that we've looked at? Um, in order to, to, to get this funded. Our, our policy and practice for these types of noise walls has always been to assess the benefiting properties. So it would be a change of policy that the council, you know, could make that direction. It's not included in any budgets. Uh, you just approved the project to assess properties to the south. I think if you decided to pay the 10% cost with general tax dollars, that'd be a, a difficult conversation for that. <laughs> the one that just got approved by the previous resolution. So that's what we've done in the past is assess those benefiting properties. 
Okay, thank you. Director Milner, would you remind us, uh, it seems like over time we've talked about this project and there are condominiums to the south of the Loden, uh, some other prob you know, probably apartment buildings, and then there are some uh, single family homes on zero lot lines, right, I think, uh, in that uh, cluster right on the corner. What were the general sentiments of those folks uh, that were south of the Loden uh, over time as to whether they wanted it or not? Uh, most were concerned with the financial obligations of an assessment. So I think we had one or two right on Lincoln Drive, right next to the highway that thought it was a good idea. But in 2018 and in this time, the public comments were, I don't even notice the highway. I really don't, we don't need the wall and I'm concerned about trying to pay for that assessment, even though they're lower because there's a lot more units here. But that was kind of the sentiment of only a few supportive. Yeah, I remember that uh, well. I mean, even if they were in the third tier of the condominium south of the Loden, they were concerned about that cost burden, which was not significant, but those, uh, you know, there's still significant money to those folks. Correct. So to, to, to Member Jackson's point, um, You've got a significant number of people that don't want the benefit. You know, the only other experience I've had on this was years ago when the, that sound ball was built uh, coming down from St. Louis Park on an extension basis. Uh, it was built on the east side to cover Sunnyside Road and then built to the creek. And then we then it stopped. But on the west side, there were some neighbors that led the opposition and they didn't want it. Well, they got lucky later on, uh, 10 years later maybe, and they said uh, they did want it. And MnDOT happened to be available to, to put that sound wall together south, as I recall, south and north of the creek, right through there. But mostly south of the creek to protect those folks in that little pocket neighborhood over there. So people can change their mind and sometimes MnDOT can come back, but I think it's a real rarity when that happens. Yeah, I would agree, Mayor. The, the the project you mentioned, the one north of the creek, it was part of a bigger pro highway project, and they did it. And they offered it to that project south of the creek and west, and they said no. But 15 years later, that area rode to the top of the list, and MnDOT came to the city and asked us, and that's when we participated in 2017 with that project, using the same policy and discussions we have now. And I remember thinking at the time uh, that wall was voted on uh, and turned down on the west side that, you know, that same analysis that Member Anderson went through was in my mind that they were they were passing up a significant financial contribution from MnDOT, uh, but they didn't they didn't want the benefit at the time. And so they, you know, it passed them by at least for 10 or 15 years. Member Pierce? No, I, I was um, just talking out loud on mute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but as I, when I uh, read through some of the, the feedback from the load and the other issue, which I think is, is, is common when we're doing assessments, is questioning uh, the actual cost and the benefit to um, the load and um, to the, the apartments. Um, if you brought that slide back up, I think we can see the ones that were impacted. Um, and so I think that was part of it. And so my question was, when I asked about other options, um, was really geared towards trying to understand, uh, better said, the calculation of the assessment um, was more the, the question, not saying that we would not assess uh, the load. Yeah, Council Member Pierce, that was a good, I put this slide together anticipating that very question because it came up last time. So this is MnDOT's sound wall, uh, model, their noise model, how do you predict who gets the benefit? So the green dots get over five decibels, the light blue is that three to five, and this is how we determined uh, the assessments and those benefits on apartments. They actually put the uh, proposed receptor right on the balconies of the apartments. So you can see on the inside facing the highway, there's the benefit. And on the back yeah. side, there's no benefit. So 
that's how we, we use their model. It's been shown to be very accurate. And that's how we come up with those benefits. Otherwise, sure. it would be a guess. So we're, we're fairly confident then that there is value for the loading to have the wall. From a noise standpoint? Yeah. Yes. But. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Member Anderson? Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up on, on uh, Member Pierce's uh, comment, and that is that, you know, I, 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 don't, I didn't do the math. So what we know is there's, hundred and I, I believe, $172,000 uh, assessment uh, to the Loden. There is benefit to the Loden. I mean, there's some portion of that 172. And uh, I, I, I heard uh, Manager Neal's comment about the potential of a six-figure lawsuit, but that six figures is incurred by them as well. And I, I, if, if, if so, then they're trying to save $72,000 by spending 100 and then they get, maybe they sue for the attorney's fees. Is that part of it, uh, Mr. Kendall? Oh, he's there. Member Anderson, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, it is not allowed under state statute. Some attorneys have been making an argument under federal statute. I don't think that's a strong argument. So um, there's, it's not likely they would be awarded their attorney's fees, but they would probably argue for them and there's some possibility they would be granted them. I don't think there is a great possibility that, that, that they would. What's our timeline on needing to make a decision? Uh, I was going to bring our cooperative agreement back at the next council meeting. The, MnDOT has these plans basically final and, and they're waiting for this step to go up for bids because they want to construct uh, this fall. So, you know, we could make this decision at the next council meeting because um, I don't have a resolution ready for this one if, if you guys so choose to, to move it. So I could prepare that resolution and bring it at the next council meeting. Then they'd have to move that cooperative agreement back to the first meeting in March, or we bring it back in two forms and just have that discussion. So I mentioned the mid not to wait till this discussion happened tonight before we do any project splitting or separating or working on that cooperative agreement just to see what this discussion would be. The, the reason I ask uh, is, I mean, we recognize, and I'm certain that the Loden recognizes that they receive a benefit. The special benefit is of substance to them the amounts um can be debated and uh, adjudicated but i just wonder if we waited a couple of weeks and discussed this more fully with them if we can come to some agreement that might allow this wall to go in and avoid litigation it ultimately i mean the, the downside of it is we spend some money in defense and then take some amount whatever the benefit that the court determines they receive the amount over that, we have to uh, subscribe to the general fund, I believe. And and that would be the outcome in almost any 429 litigation. So uh, I, I, I just wonder if there's value to taking that step. The fair question. Um, what I'm sitting here thinking is uh, uh, Member Jackson's analysis and then your analysis I don't have any uh, doubt in my mind that we'd have a real fighting chance on the 429 test analysis. I, I think that's that's something I wouldn't be afraid of tangling with them on. And I'm not intimidated by the fact that they've sent a letter. But when you couple the somewhat uncertain outcome on that 429 test analysis, along with the fact that nobody over there seems to want it, I mean, I, if this was a city street and everybody in the neighborhood said, well, we don't want this improvement, we, we'd do it anyway because it has a broader community sort of benefit. But a sound wall has a particular benefit for that particular neighborhood that it's trying to insulate from noise decibels. And that Director Milner just illustrated that. So here you've got a situation where uh, multifamily properties, whether rental or homeowned, have a chance to have this benefit to reduce noise, but it seems like they generally don't want it, and it, for a variety of reasons. The Loden has their reasons. The people in those condominiums have their reasons. So even though we're leaving theoretically nine hundred thousand dollars on the table, and we think it probably is a good idea, you know, uh, maybe the uh, the 
wise thing to do is to follow the staff recommendation here. I, but I, it's a it's a great discussion, I think, because I personally think they're making a mistake. I, I think over time they'd really benefit from this noise wall. Now the load, and, yeah, they got their arguments about well, they can't see us from the highway anymore. How's anybody going to know we're there? Well, they people find out. I mean, I'm, I'm not, and I don't think they'd have a cause of action there, according to Mr. Kendall's analysis. So um, I don't know. I'm 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 torn, but leaning towards member Jackson's analysis is that it's a it's a it's a potential great benefit that they don't want. Yeah, I um, it's just it's tough. Like, I, I think we should be trying to figure out a way to make it happen. But I can't argue against um, it seems like they don't want the benefit. And so um, I am also leaning that way as well in terms of supporting the staff recommendation. Okay. Well, Member Anderson, we need a four-four vote here. You can, uh, you can, uh oh, <laughs> you can continue this on if you want to. Well, I'm not sure what we would continue to. Yeah. And so, if we're if we're not going to enter into, there he is. Manager Neal is desperately raising his hand, and uh, he get. He, but we need to get you off mute. And stop talking to yourself like Member Pierce was doing. Right. You you only need four votes if you're going to approve it. You you can you if you don't want to approve it, you can do that on a split vote of any, uh, of any a split vote. Yeah, so you need no. four votes to approve it. If you don't have four votes, it will not pass. All right then. Well, I don't it I don't feel like we have four votes. We have enough no. votes to vote no. So. Yeah, we have enough votes to vote no, I think. Yeah, denial only I needs three. Mr. three. Mayor, only need three. About the, the assessment. The assessment cannot be approved without four votes. So just to be clear on on what I was describing. Yep. Yeah, 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 the imposition of an assessment versus uh, denial of an assessment, different standards. All right, uh, we've got... I mean, I, I hate to do this too. I see the benefit of these sound walls and walking away from this opportunity to remember Anderson's point. This will never come again. I mean, the odds are we'll, they'll never see it again uh, as, a, as a possibility here. And I'm sure that it would improve their property values, uh, especially in those buildings south of the Loden. Um, I don't know. We got a motion uh, to deny SA 22. We got a second. We've had some pretty good discussion. People comfortable voting? Just one, one last comment. I um, I do believe, like my my heart of hearts wants to go through a process to have the conversation to see if we can uh, come to some resolution, um, but. I feel like we would end up in the same place. And so I, I think if we we tabled it, had the conversation and came back next council meeting for a decision, I still think we would be in the same place. Um, and I think what, what I can't talk myself out of is that it does appear that the majority of the community does not want the benefit. And so that that's kind of where I'm I'm torn, but um, I can't yeah I can't answer that question. But if I had to explain myself on why I voted to accept the um, recommendation, I could do that in good conscience. Um, and so that's 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 really where I am. I think it makes a lot of sense to it always makes sense to have the conversation and try to come to a joint resolution. Um, when you have these situations, um, but for this one, yeah, I, I think that's just where I am in terms of supporting the staff recommendation. Thank you, Member Pierce. Uh, Director Milner, um, between now and the next meeting, I mean, I don't see how the landscape will change. You know, you could 
try to do some quick survey work out there on those property owners south of the Loden. I don't see the Loden changing their mind at all. Uh, I'm not I'm not cowed or intimidated by that. But um, uh, if I heard if I knew that the majority of the people south of the Loden thought they would benefit from this, I'd say, yeah, let's 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 try to get this one approved too. But um, I hear you saying that wasn't the general sentiment, and that was my sort of general recollection from when we went through this and the effort initially a few years ago. Can you can you affirm that or give us a little more guidance on that? Yeah, I guess just to put it in context, there's 72 percent of the project is the Loden, so that just gives you an idea of, of percentages. So that that 28 percent that's in the uh, Manor homes, very little feedback at all in support both year in 2018 and and 22. So really the concerns with payment uh, was the primary concerns we've heard. And I see manager Neil with his hand up too. Yep. Well, uh, your honor, I think from, from our perspective, as I talked to, to uh, director Milner as well, it's also a matter of, of where we deploy our, our staff resources and staff time, you know, how much time do we want to put into a project where we've clearly got a large uh, fight on our hands if we go forward with it uh, versus uh, all the other projects that we want uh, Director Milner and his staff to work on too. So this one for us kind of came down to that was that was part of the analysis that we're making to you today. Yep. Yep. And I'll just add, I feel like people had the opportunity to comment. They all got letters and we haven't heard from people. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was open and in both years in 2018 it was pretty quiet now it's pretty quiet so okay all right we've got a motion and a second on denial on proposed project SA22 which would be the north phase of the proposed uh, noise wall improvement. Any further discussion? Um, voting in favor of the motion uh, means we're gonna deny the north portion of the project. Uh, so uh, roll call please. Clerk Allison. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. Motion passes the north phase of the proposed noise wall improvement is, will not happen. Okay, that was it was a great discussion and a lot tougher than I thought. And I don't feel any better after I voted either. Right. Oh, I was just about to say that. <laughs> it didn't help one bit. That was a bit of a downer for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was hearing this little voice saying, you know, you're, uh, we're from the government and we know what's best for you. Right. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> so we have a decision. Thank you, folks. That was a great, a great decision. And, and uh, Council Member Anderson, thanks for teeing it up. Um, all right, we're on the sketch plan review. And um, this is Director Teague has this matter and Bill Neuendorf is going to be the presenter. Bill Neuendorf, the developer. <laughs> and then we've got David Anderson from Fraunchu with us as well. And this uh, really was quite a piece of work they put together. So I'm going to turn it now over to our community development director, Kerry Teague, to introduce it. Director Teague. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Just to quickly tee this one up, this is, as mentioned, a sketch plan review where you are all asked to make a non-binding or provide non-binding uh, comments to the developer, the development team on a potential future uh, development application. So you're all familiar with the site and the project in general. This is a six-story, 90-unit senior co-op with underground parking. 
10% of the units would be for affordable housing. There would be a two story, 347 seat restaurant with 32 surface stalls. Parking would also be available from the Jerry's ramp. Parking study and traffic study would be required as part of any formal application. There'd be a little over 30,000 square foot green space and public plaza and a bridge, as you know, that's under construction or about to begin uh, that would connect over the railroad tracks to connect the site to the Jerry's parking ramp. So this request requires a rezoning. Currently it's zoned for the previous use, um, industrial, the, the old public work site. So a rezoning would be required to PUD. Flexibility would be needed through the PUD for setbacks, uh, building height, parking, and floor area ratio. So as mentioned, uh, Mr. Neuendorf and uh, Dave Anderson from Prowenshu are the, the lead developers here, and they will present the, the project in more detail. And with that, I will turn it over to Bill, who is gonna introduce the team, and then they'll present the details of the project. All right, thanks, Director Teague. Mr. Neuendorf. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It's a pleasure tonight. Um, so as Mr. Teague mentioned, um, this property is owned by the Edina Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Um, uh, each of you sit as board members on, on that group. And just as a reminder, the HRA tends to focus on matters of real estate and delivering housing uh, and redevelopment sites in the city. Um, so we've been, uh, as a HRA over the last year or so, we've been talking about different ways to make improvements on the site that follow a lot of the principles and guidance that have been discussed and debated for the last 10 years. Uh, tonight, we're presenting this sketch plan to you, uh, sitting in your role as council members, which is more of the regulatory role. So as the HRA, we don't really talk about setbacks and materials and colors and the, you know those types of, of zoning issues, but that's what we're here this evening for. Um, uh, and as as each of you should recall, uh, this site has been long studied. Um, the city and the HRA have owned it since 1962. Uh, in 2013, uh, we re we tore down the old public works facility after those operations have moved to a different site. And since since about that time, we've been studying different ways to reuse the site. Uh, uh, we've studied nine different concepts in the past a variety of different public and private uses. Um, and unfortunately, none of those previous studies have reached a point where they've been supported by the city council. Um, so we are hoping to uh, hoping that we've got a, gr a great combination for you this evening. Uh, we believe that we do, um, but also a reminder that what you're seeing tonight is not in a vacuum. Um, about a year ago, the HRA approved funding for a lot of site improvements around this property. So if you've driven through the area last summer, you saw a lot of road construction, new sidewalks, new street trees, new boulevards, new paving, street lights, et cetera. Um, uh, that work will continue this summer. Um, and a lot of that infrastructure work is intended as a prelude to make this uh, site, the vacant site, fit into the surrounding neighborhood. So uh, we've got a great team with us tonight um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Anderson. Uh, Dave is with Franchu Companies, and the HRA hired Franchu to really serve as our broker on this project. Um, they have a great wealth of information about this property. They have also studied it with us on a few occasions over the years. But in this capacity, we really challenge Dave and his team uh, to help us find the right combinations of users for this property. Um, and we've got representative, representatives of each of those folks on the call tonight. Um, I'll turn it over to Dave for a quick introduction and then we'll, we'll get rolling with the presentation. Thank you, Manager Neuendorf. Mr. Anderson, welcome. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Uh, great to be with you this evening. Dave Anderson with Frau and Shoe. And, uh, I will, uh, I'll just pick up uh, on a few additional uh, items to cover and, and share with you as we uh, then I get set to share a, a bit of an overview of the uh, of the sketch plan uh, presentation this evening. Uh, but as Bill mentioned, uh, this really has been a, 
um, as best you could describe it, a collaborative effort of um, of a team of of folks that are representing the the components of this site. So over the past several months, uh, the uh, efforts of United Properties, along with Pope Associates, uh, working on the senior cooperative uh, component and uh, the efforts of um, Jester Concepts and Shea Design, their design lead, um, and uh, on the restaurant hospitality component. And then uh, the uh, Grandview Yard, uh, which has been led by Confluence and Tom Swenson and others uh, with Chad Milner and the Public Works Department. This has really been a collaborative effort to arrive at a design solution and a plan solution around this three acre site that really drives um, towards those seven guiding principles, which have, have you know, continued and remained the cornerstone of, of this effort. Um, I'll just touch on one other element of, of this, and, and that is the, the bringing along of the, um, the restaurant and hospitality uh, component um, of, of the project. And uh, as, as you recall, through the HRA's uh, initiative uh, earlier this fall, we went through a process to engage the market and reached out to some uh, 35 plus restaurant groups, some operating many uh, different concepts, both uh, locally, regionally, uh, and nationally. And we uh, made an outreach uh, effort, uh, communicated with several uh, of those uh, entities that uh, had um, some interest or curiosity about the site. Uh, we laid out a very specific uh, concept of the kinds of activities and engagement, hospitality, uh, use with indoor uh, and outdoor functionality, a lot of the components um, that uh, that uh, the HRA and, and through our discussions had been expressing a desire to see. And through that process, uh, we uh, we uh, came through that with a with a expression of interest in a, a great presentation by Jester Concepts. And uh, through that process and in HRA engagements, Jester has joined on the team and has continued uh, with their interest in this project. And what you what you will see tonight is a uh, is really a culmination of the efforts over the last several months since that engagement uh, in October. Uh, so Brent Frederick uh, and um, and his design team are here with us tonight. So with that introduction, um, the history of the co-op a piece of it, uh, perhaps we can touch on a bit more later. But I will just uh, at this point uh, turn it over to Terry Manerick, and he's going to walk through um, the site plan and the components. And uh, as I mentioned, members of United Properties, Jester, and the design team uh, are all here with you tonight, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mayor Hovland. Mr. Manerick. Mayor Hovland, council members, nice to see you again. Um, I'm going to turn off my video when I start this and share my screen, but um, I'm just going to provide a quick overview of the packet images that you have, and, uh, and I can leave that up for questions and comments later as well. So let me start sharing my screen here. You should be able to see it, am I right? We can see it. Awesome. So this image um, is somewhat to help understand context. We've placed the former Public Works Yard in the middle of this uh, Google Earth photo. Uh, the Public Works Yard and the project site is uh, highlighted in color, and the surrounding context is in black and white. For your orientation, north is to the right, um, to the left is south, to the north is west, and then to the bottom of the screen is east. So um, in relationship to the development of the site, you can get some general context here. We have the Eden 100 office building, Hilltop restaurant, uh, existing commercial with the Starbucks drive through to the north. We have the parking ramp as part of the existing commercial district over here, uh, Jerry's Foods, and then the Avador Living. In context of ro roadways, we have Eden Avenue, um, and then Arcadia Avenue, which borders the east side of the property. You can see the new proposed roundabout as part of Eden and, and Arcadia intersection. And we have that as part of this overall design concept as well to show you how everything will fit together. Um, I'll show you a series of slides. So I'll give you a quick overview here, but you can see the Grandview Yard to the north side, the proposed and under construction pedestrian bridge that will connect to the parking ramp and staircase down into the commercial district. Uh, you can see the railway line that uh, transcends the west side of the site, the senior co-op. And then in the middle here, we have the uh, restaurant um, development as well as part of this. 
The overall site in plan view, just to give you some more context, on the, on the west side, you see the existing railway. On the north side, the pedestrian bridge, the existing commercial with Starbucks drive-through, Arcadia to the west, and then Eden to the south. So you can see the relationships the senior co-op has um, to the uh, Eden Avenue entrance with a, a parking access, but also off Arcadia, there's an entry into a co-op entry plaza drop-off at the main entry to the co-op and a secondary parking access at a higher level. With the grade change that occurs on site, uh, the building tower on this side of the co-op is slightly taller than the building tower by one floor on this side of the co-op, so that provides us opportunity for multiple access into a, a multiple level of parking. Um, we also have some small surface parking for the co-op for temporary visitors, uh, but there's also visitor parking within the co-op as well. As part of the restaurant pad, we have an events lawn, an outdoor dining area, and a restaurant building. Uh, the restaurateur chose to set the restaurant back in the site so that a lot of the outdoor activities related to the restaurant could be engaged into the larger Grandview Yard and Park space, but also create a little bit of a sense of privacy away from Arcadia um, as part of this development. You can see we have a small parking area here that holds approximately 30 cars. There's two means of entry here. Since I'll show you in the next slide how we're dividing up the property, but there's an access to the restaurant property that leads you into the parking. This would be more for um, ADA parking and immediate uh, short-term parking, as well as a restaurant valet that'll distribute the cars um, within parking, including the parking ramp and other parking areas within the district. There's also a service area for the restaurant at the west end of the site, and then this road potentially loops around and then uh, drops off at the co-op entry and then exits the site as well. You can see how the site is divided up with the Grandview Yard, the restaurant property and the senior co-op property. Um, these boundaries are approximated to the layout that currently exists, but you can see the relationships of how the three kind of intertwine together. Oh, I think I missed one here. This is a section that cuts through the site in the background, for context, you can see the 5101 office tower. You can also see Jerry's. The Jerry's parking ramp is, to, or the city parking ramp associated with Jerry's is right behind here as well. You can see the height of the restaurant building and the height of the senior co-op don't exceed the height of the 5101 office tower and are at the same elevation as the Avador uh, living building behind. Um, the existing site, as you can see on this bottom line, this is the existing grade of the site. It sits in a bit of a hole, and the existing grade of Arcadia Avenue is the secondary red line that follows along this slope here. You can see the relationship between um, the Grandview Yard, the restaurant, and the senior co-op, and as we begin to move down the site, it creates a series of terraces that provide direct access to Arcadia Avenue, but also accommodate a variety of smaller flat spaces for a variety of activities as well. And in relationship to that is the pedestrian bridge, which unifies the, the Grandview site uh, from this area over across the tracks uh, to the commercial district. This is a view looking northwest. You can see the senior co-op as it faces Eden Avenue. As I mentioned, there's this parking access. It goes off Eden Avenue, and here you can see the two-story parking structure. We also have some short-term parking that could be used for just general parking, but also as potential move-in uh, for the building tenants. Uh, there's an amenity deck that'll sit between the two towers and the central connecting spine uh, that provides an amenity for the residents. You can see the relationship to the railroad as it starts high at Eden Avenue and then begins to sink lower as it engages the rest of the site. This shows a great relationship between the roundabout and Arcadia Avenue it begins, as it begins to bend and wind and connect into a perpendicular intersection. Uh, the relationship with the new planted boulevard and then the pedestrian sidewalk as well that transcends all the way along Arcadia Avenue from north to south. And then the relationship to the, the senior co-op. And you can see these buildings are pretty generic in what their design is right now. Obviously, they, we haven't dug into that sort of form of detail, but we show you the general form and how we're addressing the street by stepping the building back to provide a little bit more comfort and distance from the street as well. And then to the north, you see the restaurant and the outdoor yard, the parking area, Grandview Yard, and then the pedestrian bridge. This is a view like if we were standing directly on top of the co-op looking down to the parking area. You can see the restaurant valet drop-off area, the service area here. The restaurant building itself, which is at grade a two-story, but there's also another level below grade. The access to that speakeasy happens underneath this entry uh, a canopy right here as it goes down to the next level. We have screened rooftop vents and then the backside of the building uh, butts directly to the, uh, the railway property as well.
Um, as part of the restaurant, there's an outdoor dining area that also has outdoor fire pits and relaxation areas uh, for a variety of different activities, but also an event lawn that could be used in conjunction with restaurant activities and then potential spillover from the Grandview Yard. The Grandview Yard to the north is engaged to the restaurant pad by a sloped lawn. That sloped lawn leads to a larger flat lawn that's approximately, I think, about 110, 120 feet by 40 to 50 feet wide. We also have a small seating area at this end of the yard that could be used as a potential stage or a, a, a setup area for um, movies in the park where the screen could be set up. And then as you see, um, and you're familiar with that section I just showed you, we have a terracing site that comes from the elevation with the pedestrian bridge to get over the railway tracks. We begin to terrace down a series of levels here to get us to the flat area of the Grandview Yard. So you'll see not only sidewalk access and seated terraced hillsides, but you also see an ADA accessible path that'll lead you from the pedestrian bridge through the site. And along that path, we've created a, a naturalized planted area that allows opportunities for seating and gathering, intimate conversations and just viewing of the park. Within this area of the park, we also have a variety of different opportunities of lawn areas, but well-planted areas that create these nice buffers and separation for the people within the park. And then these blue objects that you see here that say art, that's just a potential placeholder for art within the park that um, could become part of this project as well. Uh, with the grade change along Arcadia, you see some terracing that has to happen here with retaining walls to provide some of these spaces. And that also creates a great opportunity for some branding of the park as well. This is a view looking south, so you begin to see the relationship between the restaurant and the co-op and the entry plaza. So the parking area sits slightly higher than the co-op main road and entry plaza, and then the main entry to the senior co-op as well. This is that access to the, to the parking um, on the north side of the co-op. Um, we will have some buffering of the railway yard. You can see this in the Grandview Yard, but also along the edge of the co-op and the restaurant uh, development as well. This is a shot looking to the northwest where you really begin to see the relationship between the restaurant and the Grandview Yard. Um, the pedestrian bridge is here to the north. You see those little areas of uh, planted landscape that have art opportunity in them, small gathering areas, the terrace seating again, the larger uh, sloped lawn, and then the opportunity for programming that can happen within the space that would you know, vary between summer and winter, uh, a variety of different activities, movies in the park, you could have small little festivals here, you could have uh, performances and concerts um, that could be in association with just the yard or the restaurant as well. So there's a, a great synergy between the two and then um, a terrace uh, wall at the bottom that provides a seating element within the transition between these two spaces. There'd be signage for both the restaurant and the co-op along Arcadia as part of those entries as well. This is a view looking to the southwest. Um, here we show again that relationship between the three spaces and you can see that it's a well-planted, well-landscaped area. So um, the parking and the circulation is hidden within there, but we feel that this provides a great opportunity for movement and circulation between the three spaces. Um, the ADA accessibility uh, from the pedestrian bridge to the restaurant would occur along Arcadia. Um, as we go through the site, we don't have that great change within the site, but along Arcadia, we can accommodate that. And another big element of this park space is the public restroom. So this public restroom would piggyback on some of the utilities of the restaurant building and provide a uh, lockable public restroom space as part of the park space, which is pretty unique for a lot of parks uh, within the city. And then here's the last shot of Arcadia Avenue looking towards the restaurant and Grand View Yard. You can see the branding and the relationship between the grade change uh, and the subtle balances between the terraces as they relate the, the Grand View Yard to the restaurant and into the co-op. So that's it. That's my quick presentation and I can leave it on some of these slides here for questions and discussion. Are there questions for Mr. Menarik? Comments? Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead, Member Jackson. So I have both questions and comments. Um, the first three questions I think are from Mr. Teague. Um, we talk about 10% affordability in the co-op. Is that at 50% of AMI or what, what level of AMI are we talking about for the affordable units? Yes, so at doing 10%, they would, they would need to be at 50% AMI. If, okay. If they chose to go 60% AMI, then 20% of the units would need okay. to be affordable. Thank you. 
And we adopted a sustainable building policy. You and I have talked about this, and you said it's not going into place until um, April 1st. But uh, can we require that since we're the the HRA is the owner of the land, or can we make sure that that's part of the discussion? Uh, we certainly can as the landowner, if that's what we would like to see. Um, I believe okay. we, we could do that. Yeah, I, I think that's part of our um, Grandview principles is sustainability and innovation. So I, I'd really like to see that be a part of this project, um, all three parts of it. Um, and then you and I also talked about the setbacks and it seems awfully close on Arcadia. Can you tell me what the difference between the curb and the building is on the co-op versus the Avador? Uh, it is. Um, I've got a couple of slides that, that may show that. Um, Terry, if you could take that yep. down, I'm going to. Uh, Okay, is, is that showing up? No. It is. Well, it's a picture we just saw. Yep, yep, I'm gonna, so. Okay. There we go. So at this point here, there's a seven foot setback to the lot line in between the two red arrows. To the curb, the setback would be 18 feet. Okay. And you can see the building is angled to the street, so there's more green space as it moves to the west. And this is a graphic of the Avador to the west. This okay. is the building here. So the setback for the Avador is four feet from the building to the lot line. And from the building so the curb is 18 feet. And I believe I may have said, so it, with, with the senior co-op, it's seven feet to the lot line and 25 feet to the curb. Okay. I think I said that wrong the first time through. So to the curb, 25 feet for the proposed building, to the curb for the Avador, it's 18 feet. And that okay. one is parallel to the street. So the impact is much greater than what's proposed here. Okay, and up there where the, the 5.0 is highlighted, Yes, so the setback on Arcadia with this relocated street in order to accommodate the the uh, the roundabout mm -hmm. street angles like this. So the the building set the building setback gets much closer on Arcadia. So that is five feet there as well. And then the distance to the street from the edge of the building. Uh, that was about 15 feet. Okay, so right of way in there. Okay, so right there, that's actually closer than the Avador is, but it's a pretty small portion. Correct. Yep. Okay, and then down there, where it's not highlighted, the 5.0 is that also about 18 feet? Yes. Yep. Yep. There's about a 10 feet of right of way um, from the lot line from the the proposed new lot line to where the edge of of the street would be. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's awfully tight on Arcadia there. Um, so I don't know what, what that means, but it, it does feel tight. So my next question is actually for Mr. Neuendorf. Um, when we've looked at this site, uh, we talked about a potential train station. If for some reason the um, train line does get commute, uh, turned into a commuter line. Do we have a space someplace for a, a um, station if in the future that happens? We certainly could. Um, uh, thank you for the question. In this site plan, we've not designed a location for a future train station, but certainly the way we've laid out this concept plan, we're providing a 10 foot easement between the back of the buildings or the retaining walls to the railroad property. Um, along the railroad property, they have a similar 10 foot eas easement for our use. Um, so if the train track would ever go away, um, uh, we've got a, we have a route to get to the tracks on the east side. Um, we could certainly do a station 
uh, there'd have to be a lot of reconstruction, but in that public park space, that's, I believe, part of the reason why we wanted to maintain public ownership of that park area. But I think the also, uh, another one of the biggest opportunities in the future is the entire western portion of the tracks. The city owns Brookside Avenue, which runs directly parallel with the train tracks on the west. We own that parking structure on the west side of the tracks. And the city owns all the property behind Walgreens and the liquor store. That large, um, looks like a surface parking lot, uh, that's actually city owned property. So uh, there's actually a few acres of publicly owned real estate that on the west side of the tracks that might present a, a different opportunity. So uh, at this point, there's no plan for a future uh, change in that train track. But if there ever would be, I think the city certainly has multiple options on how to access the tracks at this point. Okay, great. Um, and then if we could have Mr. Menard's slide number two. Um, I don't know, it's just the uh, aerial view of the site. Yeah, that one. So I've been out walking a lot this winter. And one of the comments in the um, uh, planning commission was, well, this is green and it's lovely in the summer, but what about winter? And since we're starting with one ownership before we break this up, I would like to see a path going from the front door of the co-op or the co-op sidewalk that then goes through that parking lot and into the yard that makes a nice walking loop. And whether we, you know, get an easement over a couple of those parking places and mark them as pedestrian, I think if you could make this an area where you could get out and walk, you know, a half, a half mile loop or something like that, this that would activate it um, through the whole year. And it it kind of jiggy jogs through that parking lot from the um, co-op to the Grandview Yard. I'd like to see that middle portion um, connected so that you did have a sense of this is a place I could go and walk. And if I did three laps around it, I'd know I got a mile or, or if I did five laps, I'd, you know, have a certain distance under my belt and, and people would, would like to have that in the winter time, a safe, um, open place to walk. Uh, but right now it isn't connected. So if that's can be done, um, I'd like to see that. Um, the second thing is one of the guiding principles is to turn barriers into opportunities. And I know that small children like to see trains and that here we have a park right on a train line um, somewhere near the public restroom up there. If there was a way to have some kind of engagement with watching the trains go by and maybe a history of what the Dan Patch line was or some some way to say there's a, a railroad, people like to see trains um, and, and if we could engage with the trains that go by. I think that would be kind of a nice um, amenity. It wouldn't cost anything, but um, but it's there. Um, also in the planning commission, they talked about separating the um, uh, parking ownership from the co-op, um, uh, the housing part of it, and those would be different things that you could buy in the co-op. I thought that was a really clever idea, and um, I, I endorse that. Um, again, we talked about the um, sustainable building policy. I'd love to see this restaurant um, engage in what it, what a green restaurant is. Um, I think that would be a really cool amenity for people to come there just to say, hey, we've got this great new restaurant and this is what can be done in a future looking way um, for what restaurants uh, look like in the time of climate change. Um, with the um, loss of the Perkins, uh, we lost a place for kids to go after football games um, there is going to be this this upstairs part of the restaurant, and um, there are a couple opportunities that we lost that were public things. So one was kids could go to the Perkins after a football game. It'd be kind of cool to engage um, the crowds from the football games, um, a reason for them to come to this area. It's a short walk from the stadium, um, and I, I just that's an idea to throw out there. Something else that we lost was that um, display case at Jerry's when they changed their front door. It would be nice here to have some sort of public display 
where community groups could have a glass casing to say we've got a fundraiser coming up or an event coming up and um, and something like that. So when people are out walking around their loop in this lovely new public park um, and getting out and getting fresh air, they can stop and see events that are coming up. So those are my comments. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Jackson. Uh, who would like to go next with their comments? Member Anderson? I'm in. Um, so, uh, Mr. Menarek, good evening. Yeah. Wherever you are, you're there. Mr. Menard? Sorry, my mic was up. Yes. Oh, good. good Thank evening. you very much. Um, <laughs> I, can you, can you uh, find any slide, really, that uh, is looking east-west across the yard? East-west? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. How about that one? Yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect, actually. Um, so one of the things I'm noticing that I, I had not until uh, uh, I watched the uh, Planning Commission uh, review um, is the sloped lawn, uh, which is really kind of part of Grandview Yard. And I, yep. I, I look at that and think, um, I wonder uh, what percentage of that yard is sloped. That's actually part of, of the yard, even though it's referenced as sloped lawn. Um, and I'm just wondering what the percentage of that is. It looks roughly 40 to 50 percent. Um, well, two things. We kind of consider the whole space as the Grandview Yard, but if you're talking oh. specifically about the lawn area here, I yeah, am. it's about 10 feet shorter um, than uh, than the flat area of the lawn. The, we tried to keep the slope at an angle that was usable, right, that people could sit on um kind of you know this is south facing to the sun so people could sun on this edge they could look down at events or activities or a concert that might be happening with and associated with the restaurant um just to provide an area that would be usable aside from creating a series of terraces that came down here that could be another option though to create another series of flat terraces but we do have a pretty substantial grade change of about eight feet um to ten feet um, from the uh grandview yard lawn area two down to the event lawn area. So, so we're trying to think of a way to use that efficiently. Your vertical is eight, is an eight foot drop there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you uh, did you consider um, a retention perhaps to create a little more utility by raising that slope? The purpose of the slope is really, I guess, is the idea there a general seating area adjoining the restaurant and the uh, the event lawn? Yeah, that's, that's the primary focus of that, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, well, I, it, it just seems to me like maybe if we could gain some more utility there, that could be useful. I, I just, um, I'm not convinced that there's great utility in the slope. Now, I, I guess another option could be to, you know, I, I, if there were retention and even more of a slope, more of a drop on a shorter area, that could be landscaped, um, I guess, in some way so that the, uh, the view from both the co-op, the restaurant, and the event lawn would be enhanced a little bit. But I just, um, I'm a little reluctant to just settle for that, the loss of that in terms of utility and what can actually be done. One of the things, um, as I, I know you're sensitive to, that came out of uh, the Planning Commission was activation on the site. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the more options there are, for that type of activation um, is ideal. So I just wanted to throw those two ideas out to you before we look at a final. Um, uh, let's see, okay, the, the, uh, it's, it's the matter of the overall construction schedule that, is, uh, that came up for me. And, and this, this maybe is a question for the HRA as opposed to uh, tonight, but I, I did wanna ask it because we have uh, both Mr. Anderson and Mr. Hall here this evening. Um, now, I know that the uh, the HUD financing, the master mortgage that you're pursuing, is uh, requires a 60% presale. That's accurate, isn't it? Can can you? Council Member Anderson, the, the 60% percent presale. Yes, that's correct. 60%. All right. So then, it, it, given that. Um, you're, are, are you proposing proceeding with the hospitality venue and the yard construction um, prior to that 60% presale? Is that something that the HRA would consider then? 
um, are uh, is would it would be would construction be delayed until the pre-sale requirements met? You know, I'll, I'm happy to, re to respond to that. Um, okay. I, I don't think we have a precise answer at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Our conversations to date, as far as the the real estate deals or, and and coming to terms with construction schedules, has really revolved around each of these three elements the housing, the restaurant, and the park being essential to go together. Um, uh, so we would definitely uh, have to do a lot of coordination to make sure that um, the construction schedules align. Um, and with the pre-sales required for the co-op, that essentially means that uh, as we pursue entitlements this year, uh, presuming we continue to move forward, there could be a 12-month delay on everything until we get that pre-sale. Um, so, uh, so far it's been great to work with Alex at United Properties and Brent with Jester, with Jester Concepts um, to try to figure out how to work together in the schedule. But quite frankly, we're not there yet. So that then leads me to the second part of that question is, what if it's not met? The 60% pre-sale is elusive and uh, we are delayed beyond our expectations. Uh, if that were the case, if, if, the, if, the, if this uh, housing cooperative was not viable and could not secure fun financing, um, I would expect that any real estate agreement we have with United Properties would be terminated and we would start looking for a new housing partner. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we'd start over everything from scratch, but certainly um, that would put a huge wrinkle in everyone's schedules and everyone's financing. So we do everything we can to make sure that that risk is minimized. Um, Mr. Hall, do you know, I mean, what is your experience uh, with your pre with these types of pre-sale requirements? Uh, Council Member Anderson. With uh, Applewood. Yeah, with the Applewoods. Um, we... Uh, you know, I would say that up until the pandemic, we've seen um, a little slower uh, pre-sales uh, over the last year and a half. Um, I would I would also add that um, that we've seen a pickup now recently. So I think uh, we are starting to gravitate uh, more toward the norm here. But uh, typically, we're looking at a 12 month from the time that we can start marketing and mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, we, we, you know, once we secure entitlements here or, or have a green light or are far enough along that um, I think we can all conclude that uh, we've got a project here, then, then we're able to start holding our, our monthly uh, information meetings. And, and my feeling is uh, just given uh, the fact that this is located uh, in Edina here, uh, we certainly haven't done an Applewood uh, anywhere in this area that it's going to be very popular and I, uh, as of today, would feel very bullish about the um, about the response from the uh, market. The sector's hot. I, I, there's, there, I mean, I would anticipate that you'd achieve your, your, your uh, pre-sale requirement and your experience is it's roughly 12 months from the time that you start. Accurate? Yes, on average, that'd be correct. Is, is the average sale price in Applewood uh, around the metro, uh, how does that compare with your anticipated average sale price here? Uh, this is going to be higher, um, mainly due to the building itself, uh, the fact that all of the parking is structured uh, parking. And then anytime you go over a four-story building, uh, which the majority of our Applewoods are, it puts you in a higher uh, rating, fire rating exterior wise. You're talking about a generator on elevators. So there, um, there is a premium in, in this site. Okay, all right, good. Um, well, thank you for that. I, I, I'm just drilling down on that a bit because uh, it's all the, the, the concept is really centers around the, the co-op, its construction then and how we go forward. So. I just want to have a little clarity on that. So thank you for that. Um, maybe Mr. Holmes gets this one. Uh, so it, now we, we talked, uh, actually that was during Mr. Menarch's uh, presentation 
about the blocks that are inserted to demonstrate uh, the the mass of the building. Um, and, and of course, you know, it's a sketch plan review, so it's difficult to determine to determine what the design concept is going to be. Um, and and you're not really ready for that. I understand it, but are you leaning in a certain direction? I mean, how what what do we think we might look like there? You know, I can I can Go jump ahead. in. I, I would say that we just haven't made it uh, that far at this point. What we do know is that we would like to, um, and, and, and the movement in the blocks really deviates from an initial plan where uh, it ran more or less uh, parallel uh, to the roads. And, and we felt that one thing we want to see is articulation. And, and so that's going to be um, certainly one of our goals uh, in the next step here as we uh, start um, developing uh, elevations and what that'll look like. But also we want to um, really engage kind of those first floor uh, homes that run along Arcadia there. Uh, we have done this at, at at least one other Applewood, uh, creating kind of separate entrances for those uh, first floor oh. units. Um, and, and so that uh, uh, really engages the, uh, the the streetscape sidewalk uh, uh, with, with those homes. Uh, so so the, the community doesn't feel, you know, for lack of better description, kind of isolated or, or, um, uh, or uh, closed off uh, from the surrounding community. So those are some of the initial discussions we have, but uh, we really haven't um, uh, we, we haven't started talking about materials and things like that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, well, I, I, Mr. Mayor, are we moving into comments um, by individuals, stay on track with each person, or would you prefer that uh, we have comments in general at some point? I think, uh, just hearkening back to, uh, I think, um, Member Jackson covered most of her questions and comments in her presentation, I would welcome you to do the same. You asked your questions, and if you have some comments, I think you could go ahead and complete those now. Thank you. Okay, then, um, on the yard. Um, and I just I want to uh, touch base on some of the things uh, that came up at the uh, Planning Commission review. Uh, so one, it, the consistent commentary from the Planning Commission beyond parking uh, is activation of the site. Um, I, Commissioner Berube stated uh, th there isn't not very much to draw me into it. Looking at it, I think really from a consumer's eye is how I interpreted that. Uh, Commissioner Bennett um, stated that it could be a lot better and needs supplement. Um, and, and frankly, I've had a lot of the same thoughts there. Uh, and so I, it, it suggests to me uh, very focused thinking, and 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 that is really on the um, on on the activation of the site. So the the, the project narrative states uh, that the vision to create synergistic programming opportunities talks about that, as well um, as there's some other statements. I I and everybody wants this to be a smashing success. There's no question that it's been. A long time coming, and there's quite a bit of interest, and and I, I know that the community uh, is extremely interested in a quality project, and and I think it's the drawing to it um, uh, that you know what what is that going to be? Is it the restaurant only? Is it the park? Is it the relationship of the park to the restaurant? Is it mostly the co-op that is you know is the attraction and then other people will come and and so the the and I, I understand that this is a a, uh, a sketch plan review however I, I, my, my thoughts go to what are we what are, what's what's the end game here what are we trying to create in the end and that has been among the council members and the HRA has been uh, a source of very um, stimulating conversation trying to come to conclusions what what are we what 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 can happen here that makes this a, a tremendous community asset and so I think that um, 
I think that that some of the comments that come, especially with the yard and activation that come from the Planning Commission should be uh, um, strongly considered. As we move on to the restaurant, um, it, the juxtaposition of that building with its proximity to the yard and its open areas, the design are really quite attractive. Um, the only concern or request that I would have is some diversity in the menu or the offerings um, that allows uh, more involvement. If it's a, you have a variety of people in the community from all economic strata that we hope are attracted to this setting. And and so, you know, if we don't really have a, a diversity in menu and diversity in offerings, then it could be that some people are not going to be very well served as we come to the public utility piece of it. So I just I just offer that um, internally. We've had conversations about what could you do there in the morning? What are the walkers? What do the bikers receive? How do they uh, how, how will they interact with the restaurant if that's going to be a significant part of the draw? So I just I'm, I'm throwing that out because um, the building's great. And I think the intent there is great. Um, I'm just hoping that there is, you know, simply more than, you know, the uh, the the stated menu or other options that could be introduced or even just a, a more diversity, even to varied lunch menus um, on the co-op. Uh, I, I want to be completely clear. And I know that we've talked about, you know, 10% as affordable, but this is an affordable for sale option. That's accurate, isn't it? Mr. Dundorf, uh, then? Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, I got stuck on mute. Yes, this okay. is a for sale building. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, you know, this, great. Thank you. I just, it, it was, it wasn't, totally clear from the earlier conversation or what I was hearing even through the planning commission. I know what we discussed. I just wasn't sure if we were still on that. So that is really important. The ownership, the affordable ownership option is a big piece of it. And I think that that is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Mr. Noondorf, that's really the first time this will have been, be the first time that we have an affordable for sale option here. It's been many years. Uh, yes, it's been, uh, we've had a couple co um, condos built, but those are all market rate luxury. Um, I honestly can't think of a of the last project that was for sale. Be around Centennial affordable. Lakes. And that wasn't really it's considered. It was essentially affordable, but we didn't, it wasn't discussed in that way. So it would be a, I think yeah, that's. Edinburgh or Centennial Lakes back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. So I think this is, that's really important within the context of the ownership concept uh, is the is is that and um so then just moving on to the building itself uh council member jackson has brought this up and i i share her concerns with the setbacks um because they're very very narrow especially along arcadia when you turn that corner onto eden that's seven feet there's five feet in some areas there and so it's, it's incongruent as we stress the biking and pedestrian experience with those kinds of setbacks. Every time that we that those setbacks approach the street, the closer they get, the less exciting it is, the less it lessens the pedestrian experience ultimately. Um, so I, I'm, there's, there's certainly ways to correct that and, and that's one of the things we're talking about tonight. Um, and, and so the, the, the East Cooperative Elevation there uh, along Arcadia is that's a long uninterrupted uh, walk. Now, if there are if there's doorways, um, if if there are entries onto Arcadia there, that'll break that up quite a bit and present some interest. Um, so it's uh, it's something to consider. Um, the other thing, one of the commissioners mentioned and, and expressed reservations about the Eden Avenue approach towards the library and the senior center. Um, and, and you know, I, it is, it's very tight there at the Abador. We've discussed that earlier this evening. Um, so how that can be enhanced and the, the walk along Eden, which certainly the cooperative owners will make as well as others in the community as they walk towards the senior center, the library, um, if they wanna walk the back door into Jerry's 
all of those um, issues. So that that does need attention because we're only going to do it once, and we want it right from the from the get go. Um, I guess I guess that's it. The, 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 my biggest concern is a setback, and I'm hoping that we can find better utility in the in that slope lawn. And then a great deal of focus given to activation of the whole site. But thank you for your time tonight. This is we're like I feel like we're knocking on the door of a great project and something that's really necessary, the housing element. I mean, we're 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 close. We're very close there, and that's exciting. So thank you. Thank you, Member Anderson. Member Pierce. Uh thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um so I, you know, I'll start. I, I don't I don't really think I have questions. Um, just comments at this point. Um, I, I remember last year we looked at a proposal and the words, we are not inspired, right? I, I never forgot that. Um, and so I, I think about those comments um, and that led us to have a conversation that said, we don't even have a construct that would even allow us to get anything approved on that site. And we voted to go into a, a, a working session to talk about, could we come up with a construct that could provide some benefit for the community and allow us to kind of get off the block um, and develop this property. Um, and I can, you know, sitting here today, I can say what we have put together is inspiring. And I think you have to look no further than the kind of feedback that we're getting now. Um, and so we're getting feedback now that's saying, hey, this, this could be great. What can we do from an activation perspective? That was a lot of what um, the Planning Commission talked about. Um, so now, you know, here was a hole in the ground. And now we have some, we have great renderings. We have a way to provide um, senior housing and affordable um, for sale options, as Member Anderson talked about. Um, we have this, this yard, this space that we can um, now think of it as a canvas and we can figure out how we want to activate that to bring people to um, this area. Um, and so I think th that we have the makings of that. Um, the the um, one, one thing that I would, and so in general, I love the design. Um, I liked, as you talk through the visual, you actually talked about areas where there could be artwork. We talked about uh, where we could have different activation on that site. I love the the idea, and I thought this was in there the last time we we um, saw a rendering where on the yard there was a I thought there was a higher retaining wall to kind of level that um, the yard off. And Member Anderson asked about that. Um, I don't remember how high that was, but I, I seem to remember it was uh, high enough that, you know, someone could actually sit on the wall. And so I thought we were looking at ways um, to make that land more usable uh, for different activation. Um, I think from a city perspective, I do think it's on us to also think about programming and how we can, as a city, bring programming to that area that will draw people in. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about that um, in, in a very serious way. Uh, we talked about the movies. I think at some point we might have talked about curling. Uh, we talked about perhaps like ice rinks, those kinds of things. Um, but I think the city, we should be uh, really trying to help think through how on the yard side we could come up with programming that would uh, further engage uh, the community. Um, and so I say that with a caveat that um, this can't be all things to all people. And we have to face reality for what it is, not as we wish it to be. 
And so I don't think we're going to be able to get everything done on this site. Um, and so I'm going to use one example. Um, I, I don't believe my teenager, who does go to the Perkins today <laughs> with her friends, I don't think if this restaurant is a speakeasy or like a Coletta or some other restaurant that we have today, I don't think high schools are going to go there. Nor do I think if we put something like a Perkins there, that other community members would actually go there for dinner. Um, and so I, I think I liked the original concept of the restaurant. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be something where we're going to be able to to um, provide an experience uh, for multiple groups of people that they would enjoy from the restaurant perspective. Um, it's just how I think about that. Um, I when I when I look at the setbacks, and this may sound odd, but I don't have an issue with the setbacks on Arcadia. And the primary reason I don't is because when you're on Eden, um, uh, we looked at where the Avador is and where this, this building would be. So on Eden, it's actually not an issue at all the way this building is, is constructed. There's more green space on that side. And when you round about on Acadia, when you pass the, the uh, co-op, then you're, you're next to the yard. And you're next to the yard with nothing over you all the way to, to Vernon. Uh, and so I, I uh, don't have an issue with that because in my mind, we will also at some point have that bridge redone. So there's a project to redo that, the, the uh, Vernon Bridge as well. And so I do think that once you, while it is close, once you pass that building, um, then I, I think it opens up uh, because you're next to the park. The restaurant is um, is is on the side of the park next to the um, the rail the railway, um, and so I think it opens up. Um, and so I, I don't I don't have an issue uh, with the setbacks, even though they are um, closer. Um, and I think I would. We we, we actually have the, the last comment I'll make. We do have. Um, a lot of feedback on um, a different project of residents wanting more restaurants on this side of, of 100. Um, and so I, I do think there's going to be, depending on what kind of restaurant we put in there and the, the proposal we saw before I thought was great, um, I think there will be um, a, um, an audience, uh, 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 there will be consumers for that that type of um, restaurant. Um, and then finally, I, I would just circle back to uh, where I started. I think we have something here that um, is getting people excited. Um, and I think if we can answer the question on how we can provide activation on that site, um, I know some of the comments are, are alluding to activation beyond a restaurant. Um, when you actually go out there, it's not as much space, usable space, as um, I originally thought it would be uh, last year. Once you go out there, um, there is just not as much space as I originally thought. Um, and so I think we're going to have to be creative in programming um, on that in that location in order to bring to drive people um, to that that area and i think it warrants us having summer fall winter types of um, activities and if we can do that um, i think we will end up with a grand view yard that will be um, inspiring for the community and that would, would draw people in uh, just as uh, Centennial Lakes continues to do today. Thank you. Thank you, Member Pierce. Member Stoughton? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Here my screen. Um, can everybody see that? We can. Yep, they're up now. The guiding principles are up. Yeah. So, um, let me just start by echoing a lot of the comments. I'm I'm really excited about this. I do think it's inspiring. I do think we're on the right track. I think we're very close. And and so all of my comments are kind of with that as a backdrop. And and so I'm I'm really excited about this. I, as I think about this project, one of the things that I've recently which is the very first one. It calls for leveraging publicly owned parcels in a civic presence to create a vibrant, connected district. So that's for integrated public and private. And I look at this. It's a great, it's a great image because it shows you the context and what's possible here in terms of the catalyst that this can provide. 100 office down here at the hilltop got this um csm starbucks you know kind of strip mall here you know it's the chance to inspire these properties to you're freezing up kevin council member staunton while you're presenting your slides you might want to just turn off your camera um, to preserve that bandwidth and then turn it back on when you're done presenting your slides. No, I'm gonna have to. Oh, thanks for moving, Member uh, Jackson. I thought I was frozen there for a second. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna stop this. Share this. It appears you got everybody talking to themselves now. All right. There we okay. go. Now, hopefully, there'll be enough bandwidth. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm very excited about what it can do for inspiring the properties around here. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think we need to be thinking about, you know, this pathway along Arcadia, as well as, and I think Member Anderson talked about this pathway that's going to get you down to the senior center and the library in Avador, or you could cut through here and go up and go to Jerry's. And so it's starting to connect the whole neighborhood. And and if you if you look at and and Member Bennett in the Planning Commission did a great job, I think, of describing this. He yeah, kept pointing out this slide number 18, which is a northern view of Arcadia. This is from the framework, page 18. And we don't have to go this far, but the point is that, it, you know, we can create something very different along that pathway. And so when I hear, um, when I hear folks talk about entrances along here, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that really could help activate this and make it a much more interesting walk because we are talking about creating a pedestrian friendly kind of environment here. And and as you do that, it becomes a shorter walk or a shorter feeling walk as you go up. And then you might invite redevelopment on this side to, to mirror image that. Um, so I'm, I think that this is working well and it just, you know, it's a sketch plan. So I get that there's just block buildings here. So I would like to see some of that work happen over time. Um, the other big point I think I wanted to raise was that this, this Northern end needs to feel like a park 
with a restaurant amenity, not a park next door to a restaurant. And so, you know, we've we've got this image here that creates these two different properties. That may be where we end up going, but I don't want to think about it that way. I want to think about them being integrated. So when we're talking about how we activate this, and I think the Planning Commission made some great comments on that, we should think about it together, not necessarily separate. And so I'd really encourage the restaurant operator to work with the, the parks folks to come up with some ideas. And I do think there is some possibility with this terrain. You know, if you think about this sloped lawn right here, if that was flat and you put something underneath this, this could be a green roof to that. It might have some windows that would look in on it. And maybe that's a curling thing or something like that that you could do that could be accessible from the restaurant. I don't know. That's just one idea, but I'm just throwing that out there. Um, it's It really does a great job of connecting to this parking ramp, which is going to activate that. There was a great suggestion in the, um, in the planning commission about this face of this um, parking ramp. We might want to think about how we can dress that up at some point. Um, if I go back to the guidelines, you know, the whole notion under the seven guiding principles of using the terrain, having these buildings down here does a great job. We can get six stories, but we're still not any taller than this, than this building here. And so it is using the terrain really cleverly to accomplish that. And I think I was pleased to see the, the railway passage is still open for future use. So I think it's really good. The thing that I really think we need to focus on is this activation here, this this restaurant yard, how do we make it so that it's a destination that people want to come to, not just for a restaurant? And I think, you know, um, Member Pierce makes a good point. It doesn't have to be all things to all people, but it should be something a little different that you can than you can find anywhere else in the community. And why not add that in there to create that activation? So, so I think I think we're in a great and I'm really pleased with it. And, and I want you to keep going and keep working on it. And um, and I'm really excited about it. Thanks. Thanks, Member Stoughton. Uh, I join my colleagues in saying that this meeting uh, is meant to kind of boost everybody up to the next level and keep them going, because I think we're all uh, really of the mindset that this this is something special. This has finally become something special. When you clicked on Bill's presentation, I don't know who put those slides together. Maybe it was Mr. Menarek, but I'm sure Bill had a role. And you see that first slide that Kevin had up there for quite a while. You you, you just wanted to go, whoa, we're, we're, we're almost there. And I think everybody has said we're almost there. Uh, I joined my colleagues in, in um, having some ongoing concern about Arcadia and the setback on Arcadia, the streetscape along Arcadia. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Hall indicated there's articulation and design yet to come along Arcadia. And I, and, and I know right away what he's talking about. He doesn't want a, a single plane. He wants it to be something that moves in and out. And when you think about articulation and you start thinking about the, that townhouse type effect uh, along Arcadia that was shown on that slide 18, uh, you can find it as close as over at the uh, at the um, Avador on that on the so west side of the Avador on the next to the sidewalk that walks up to Jerry's. There are units there that have outside entrances and outdoor pa and patios, and it has helped with this uh, building getting set back. I think above the 60 foot line. Uh, to make it feel like more of a pedestrian experience. And I think we need to think about that same thing. What's that pedestrian experience meant to be like on the east side? And let's think about uh, that setback above the 60 foot height level to make sure that pedestrians don't feel like the building is hanging over the sidewalk uh, over on that side. And then look carefully at some of those other places where we have approved that townhouse style 
uh, effect at the street level, and that's not only Avador, but it's over at Aria on the Xerxes side. It's at the Bower on the Promenade side. Uh, it's at Valley View and Wooddale, where we approved uh, that project that's being constructed right now. So there are some good examples of how to uh, soften up, I think, uh, Arcadia and still accomplish what the developer wants to accomplish there. Um, in terms of the um, uh, the restaurant, I think it's a they've they've cited it now in the right place, uh, backed up against the the wall that would be there next to the railroad tracks to kind of maximize the green space. We all want the restaurant to be successful. Uh, my notion is we, to remember Staunton's point, we've created a park that a restaurant is part of. It's going to be under private ownership. Uh, we want them to be successful in their operation. Let's let them figure that out. Uh, and not try to tell them how to be a restaurant tour because they're making a substantial investment there and it's going to be a beautiful building. Uh, I do think that there's an opportunity there with something akin to what they've done historically over at Edina Grill. And even though that's in a, a pretty tight urban environment, they've made that really family friendly over there. And so that's one of the benefits I see of that park is that there's a lot of open space for young kids to run around. If you're waiting for a table outside, your kids can run around a little bit. And, and that leads me to that whole site activation con conversation that the Planning Commission had that we've been having here. Uh, I'm open-minded on, on how that gets used because I'm, I'm thinking that there may be some uh, data out there that shows us that an unstructured environment is good for little kids or kids of a certain age I mean, I don't see kids playing touch football over there or uh, putting in basketball courts, anything like that. I, I'd just like to know what you see from a park usage data standpoint that would push us one direction or another uh, on, in terms of use. Um, Mr. Menarik, uh, I'm curious now, when we had the building in the middle of the project, it was clear that we were gonna be able to show movies on the side of the restaurant. But what do we do now? I mean, I, what's one of the clear uses I can see over there which is somewhat akin to what we have at Centennial Lakes at the Metz Old Amphitheater. Uh, you've got that stadium style seating and then you've got grassy uh, hillside and people sit there and listen to concerts. I could see that sloped area being a perfect area to sit with a blanket or a chair and watch a movie. But how, how do we do that? What's what's your thinking there? I think you're you're totally hitting it on the right point. There's two different ways, right? That's obviously a partnership with the restaurant tour, right? I think the event lawn could be the area where the stage is for a small acoustical concert or even a, or even a screen that you're talking about. Or we do have that one focal point on the west side of the of the the yard lawn that could be used for a stage or a screen focal point as well. At one time when we were first looking at this before we developed the site in context, we thought maybe even the parking ramp became a projection screen, right? To do something to the facade of that and create a projection screen. But I think there's a variety of opportunities here. And I think in, in concert with the, the restaurant tour, we can develop a pretty unique space for something like that. Right. And how about with respect to uh, uh, small performances in the park? How would how would uh, we handle that? Same same thing again, whether that's a TV screen or a stage with a band on it. Um, I think the exact same idea where people are sitting up on the lawn area on the sloped hillside and the, the, the actual performers are down in the event plaza of the restaurant tour. And that becomes part of an energy not only for the outdoor restaurant dining area, but also for the park space as well. Okay. All right, so here we are at sketch plan. We don't have anything filed yet. When we get preliminary, I think there's been a lot of good ideas advanced here between council members and also the planning commission um, uh, on different aspects of this. And, and I'm not gonna belabor it. Uh, Member Jackson mentioned the light rail station stop. I think uh, uh, manager Neuendorf did a good job of explaining how we still had that capability. And I think that's important as well. Um, there was also something mentioned uh, in the material we received from uh, uh, Planning Commission member Jimmy Bennett uh, about us owning the building and building it out and having a tenant. I, I think we've already had that discussion and and uh, put that idea to rest. That we think that the appropriate thing to be doing here is to be selling off property for uh, for the restaurant and having them take that financial risk. We have a lot of responsibilities that we need to undertake as a city and. Uh, 
I don't think we need to revisit that issue. So um, at least that would be my thought. Uh, Jester, we didn't even get to talk to you, Brent Frederick. I don't know if you've thought uh, you've had further uh, revised thinking on your plans. Is there anything you wanted to share with us? I think the lack of comment you should take as a really a positive here. That, that there's a lot of support for what you have going on, but to the extent that you have something, uh, some different thoughts than what you had before, caused by the shift in the location of the restaurant, be happy to have you. Uh, comment. Um, you know, I appreciate that, Mayor and Council members, for the feedback. I think it's all great. I took a lot of notes, um, and I know we're probably going to have a, a follow up to go over everything that was discussed today. But I took I took something from from everyone today, and um, I, it's not a go back to the drawing board situation, which is great. So I mean, tweaks here and there, I think, are you know those are widely accepted, and I think we can we can figure some things out. Um, Council Member Pierce, I just want to say thank you very much, and uh, your comments about you can't be everything to everybody. I mean, you're spot on with that. I, that really resonated with me, so I just want to say thank you for that comment. Um, we definitely have an idea of what this is going to be uh, going in. It's going to be approachable, but it's also going to be elevated. So I think that approachability will allow for uh, you know the the bulk of the population that we're that we're going for, but. Again, I mean, I, I I noted this a couple months ago when I met with you guys, and just being a resident of West Edina, like, feel like I have a good understanding of, of what's missing, and but I want to I want to work with you know the city and the park as well. I that that's the bit probably the biggest thing I'm taking away. Um, you know, thank you, Councilmember uh, Jackson and Anderson, and um, and I think you guys really hit home on what what the activation piece needs to be. So I definitely took a lot away from there. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Frederick. You know, uh, the years I've been doing this, it seems like whenever we create public realm space, uh, we see some really terrific private development occur around that public realm space. And the same thing is gonna be happening here, I believe. And um, so this park, as Member Staunton likes to talk about it as the catalyst for everything else, I think is an important consideration to keep in mind. Um, all right, well, that's it for me. I think um, uh, you're all doing a great job, uh, Dave Anderson and Bill Neuendorf and the, the whole group. Uh, thank you so much for working diligently on this. Uh, we're really coming up with some great ideas here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, we really appreciate your input. And we'll uh, combine it with that that we heard from the Planning Commission. We also met with the Park Board about a month ago, and we also met with, met with the neighbors a few weeks ago. So we've been doing a lot of listening. We look forward to uh, coming together and uh, coming, uh, coming up with a new proposal in a few months. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Manager Neuendorf. We're going to move on now to um, Commission correspondence. I don't think we've had anything come in, have we? Uh, Manager Neal or Clerk Allison? No, we haven't. Okay. Uh, anything from an aviation uh, noise update standpoint, Manager Neal? Also no. Okay. Council comments, uh, Member Staunton? Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, Manager Neal and his staff that's been um, for the efforts they've made over the past few weeks to try to navigate these times we're living in and keep everybody safe when everybody is just tired as all get out about dealing with the pandemic and they want it to go away even though it's not going away and i think you you're you're working hard to try and make it work and and um, pleased to hear from Member Anderson about the, the comments from the community as well. There's people out there that are supportive, even though there's some people who are losing their patience, there are others that are maintaining it. So I, I'm i encouraging everybody to hang on and let's get through this. And hopefully, hopefully next month we'll be all meeting in person again. Thank That's you, Member all, Mr. Mayor. Member Pierce. 
Nothing from me tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As several people have noted, the um, something hit the pedestrian bridge over Highway 62, and it's been closed. I did reach out to MnDOT um, about that, and because what people were saying is, hey, if it has to be rebuilt, can we please rebuild it in an accessible way, an ADA accessible way? And, and they've gotten that message loud and clear. So um, we don't know what the future of the bridge is, but uh, they do know that the community very much wants it to be accessible. And I hope that it gets reopened soon, but they, they have heard from us and I wanted to share that. So thank you. I would say, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, you should not expect it to be reopened soon. Um, the feedback that we're getting from MnDOT, MnDOT staff is that um, it, it could take a while to actually diagnose and, and figure out the remedy for that bridge. And if it is a, and if it is a removal and a replacement, um, there's not a set of plans just waiting for it. So it, it would have some plan development that goes along with it. And, but we will do everything we can to work with the MnDOT staff to make sure, <clears throat> make sure we have that opportunity in the future. Maybe they could take the sound wall money and move it over there. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. Member Anderson. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I just found this the the review the sketch plan review to be uh, pretty stimulating and um, I just I, I keep I keep thinking that we're really knocking on the door of something that is going to be spectacular uh, ultimately um, uh, earlier tonight uh, the uh, the city accepted uh, graciously two very significant gifts they were great um, and uh, I know that one of the uh, donors. Uh, isn't seeking a lot of recognition, but the other one, Pacey Irk, I think, and this follows uh, Mayor your comments about her, and and I it sounded as if, and confirm this if you can. Now, it, it sounds like you've spent some some time on the golf course with Pacey. I haven't. I just I've been f afraid to do it. <laughs> I see, because I it sounded like your wallet might have been just a little lighter. I don't know. Yeah, um, no, I uh, I'm trying to preserve money and dignity. <laughs> because it's hard to do with her. She's, um, she, Pacey uh, kind of broke the mold about women in athletics um, any day in high school when she was a student there. And of course, um, as an educator there for many years, I had the pleasure uh, in 1998 uh, to induct her into the very first Edina High School Hall of Fame. We, uh, Steve Dove, uh, the uh, athletic director at that time, Raleigh Ring, who many know, a uh, longtime principal here. Uh, and at that time I was president of the Boosters. And that first, that first installation was unbelievable. And the people who were installed there are virtual athletic legends uh, in the city of Edina. Uh, and, and Pacey kind of led the way on that. And, and I, I thought about that earlier today and said, you know, all this time later, uh, I, w over 20 years, I have to do the math to keep it straight, but I think it's about 24, 25 years since that first um, Hall of Fame group. And, um, and, and here Pacey is, still smiling, still athletic, and um, making a great contribution to the city she loves. And so, I, you know, if we all took that to heart and kept that going, um, it would be a big step in the right direction. That's all I have. Thank you. You're making me think about um, having had a knee replacement a few years ago, and I was talking to Pacey about uh, uh, what doctor to use, and she told me which doctor to use, her doctor. And and so when I got to the uh, physical therapy part of it, uh, the day after surgery, they put you in, in physical therapy. The I said, well, Pacey uh, told me she was riding the stationary bike uh, full tilt uh, after 24 hours. He said, don't use her as an example for anything. <laughs> he said she's a total outlier. She's like uh, Superwoman. You know? <laughs> she is. I, I can't remember how many weeks it took me to be able to make a total rotation on the stationary <laughs> bike, and she was doing it right away. Anyway, she's yeah, quite a person, and, and the Bjornis family too. Thanks so much to them. Uh, we uh, Carolyn mentioned uh, infrastructure. I wanted to 
uh, you know, there's been a lot of press lately about uh, Southwest LRT and, and just a, a few key uh, data points there. We're about 1.6 billion. We had a meeting this morning of the quarter management committee and we're about 1.6 billion expended to date. And of course, now you see some people saying, well, just unwind this whole thing. It's not worth uh, to keep going. And we're going to end up probably 400 million over the adjusted budget. The challenges on the project have been around the uh, what they call the corridor protection wall that BNSF wanted down in the Kenilworth corridor. Uh, I think they didn't expect the cost and time delay there uh, that it ended up being. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the Eden Prairie Town Center station ended up being something that got added in after the fact that is quite a, a good uh, station facility, but that took some time to do that. But the big trouble spot has been the Kenilworth Corridor Tunnel. And they're building a really sophisticated, what they call a secant uh, wall. Um, and it's just been an enormous problem dealing with shifting soils and tight conditions. They're working in about a 50 foot trench down there with a uh, you know, doing a cut and cover project on there. So we're over 60% completed. Uh, as I said, 1.6 billion expended to date. Uh, if we tried to unwind this thing, we'd have to pay a billion dollar fine uh, from the, to the federal government. And uh, it would probably take another two, 300 million to unwind everything that we've done. So uh, to those folks that want to just abandon the whole thing, you know, that's not a wise, a wise decision. So we'll, we're going to get through this. We're going to—it's the biggest public works project in the history of the state of Minnesota, and it's uh, got more challenges than you'd normally like to have. But um, it, when we're, we're we're done with this, we're going to have a system of light rail, adding 16 miles here on the on the green line, with what we call Southwest LRT to this whole system, and that'll make us uh, a, a world player, a global player, I think. Um, also, just wanted to again thank. Uh, everybody that was involved in that vaccination clinic, vaccinating uh, people, 105 people on Friday afternoon was something uh, I think really positive and a wonderful thing being done by our community. And thanks to Manager Neal and his team for getting all of that organized, plus the masks. And then uh, special condolences to our neighbor, the city of Richfield and, and, and the Wright family that lost uh, a son and um, a terrible circumstance there. Uh, and I haven't heard anything about the young guy who was fighting for his life in critical care, but uh, just an uh, awful thing. And, and I sent a note over to the mayor right away that we'd help any way we could. And we already have. We sent uh, police and fire over there right away to be of any assistance we could be. And I don't know if Manager Neal wants to comment on that when he makes his comments. Uh, the only other thing that I hadn't, I don't think I'd had a chance to cover with you was the uh, January meeting of the U.S. Con US Conference of Mayors, and it was an all-star lineup. It's, uh, the midwinter meeting is always held in Washington. I think we had probably two-thirds of the cabinet there. Crime seems to be the number one problem all around the country. I sat next to a, a mayor named Sylvester Turner from Houston, 2.3 million people in Houston. Uh, we shared breakfast two days in a row, I think, and, and uh, know him pretty well. And, and um, he's just wearing it on his face, the, the strife of the, the, the challenges around youth and crime. Uh, Lori Lightfoot from Chicago, it doesn't look like she's slept for six months because of the stress around crime in Chicago. So a, a really a big thing there. Uh, we started out with uh, the um, uh, director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. They discussed their work in the first year, the vaccination program that got set up. 75% of the country is now vaccinated. 80 million people, over 80 million people have had booster shots. Um, they've created 6.4 million jobs in the first year. That's a U.S. record. 3.9% uh, unemployment. We got to that number two years faster than they expected. Passage of the infrastructure bill. Uh, building a stronger relationship with cities and mayors across the country. He's got probably a dozen mayors working with him, so he's really city sensitive, I would say, and they're trying to work on child care and housing affordability and all kinds of, of issues that are affecting uh, all types of Americans. And um, 3.7 million renters received uh, some form of rental assistance during the pandemic. 
uh, foreclosures are uh, are one third the level they normally are uh, pre pre pandemic. Um, uh, credit card delinquency is the lowest it's ever been. Um, you know these these things that the federal government did really helped out and helped us get through this rough patch. So uh, and then we heard from Janet Yellen and we heard from Pete Buttigieg and we heard from Marty Walsh at Labor and we heard from uh, the uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, 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 Gina, oh, I forget her name, the former mayor of, uh, of Rhode Island, um, and then caught, capped off with the president on Friday afternoon, and also Merrick Garland was there as well. So we really had uh, quite a lineup of people, and I've got extensive notes, and I'll get to some of these ideas that I heard uh, here in, in time, and I've got a little bit of time, and, and put them together for us to talk about at uh, some appropriate time. So. Um, Things that they told us to get going on. Uh, each city should have a high speed internet plan. I think, I don't know, Manager Neal, if you feel like we're there on that. The things that we should be doing in anticipation of, of the federal government um, coming up with more grants. Uh, they said there's more and more coming uh, beyond uh, uh, raise. And they said uh, grants to uh, cities that build trust, money to help combat violent crime, strong focus on gun violence, uh, and more funding in a variety of different areas. And I'll give you all that information um, uh, in the days to come. So a uh, great experience. Glad I went. I had some wonderful conversations. The new president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors is a man named Francis Suarez, who's the mayor of Miami. Young guy, his dad was there. He was also the former mayor of Miami, uh, Xavier Suarez. There were some wonderful immigrant stories. There's included of uh, his dad coming here uh, from Cuba when he was four years old and uh, ended up getting scholarships to, to private schools and going on to having quite a uh, magnificent career. Gina Raimondo is the Secretary of Commerce. So. Um, I think that's it for me, Manager Neal, and uh, we're going to talk now on Manager Neal's portion of it about restructuring this agenda a little bit. Manager Neal, thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Um, yeah, and let me just say this is a this is a perfect uh, segue because what one of the things that got me thinking about our agenda and how it's structured is exactly what just happened right there. The mayor gave a a, a very nice summary. It had a nice. Uh, Kind of ramping down, it would have been a great place for him to say, thanks for coming, you know, drive home safely, hit the gavel and we all go home. So one of the changes I'm I'm proposing is that we swat is that we just reverse the order of our comments, right? And move manager comments up to the number uh, 11 position and move mayor and council uh, comments back uh, so that we're just in a reverse order. I go first and then you go second. Mayor ends up in in and at the end of his comments, he he hits the gavel and we're done. Um, I think it has a better flow to the end of the meeting. So that's one. Uh, I'm going to propose that we remove the standing uh, two standing items on our agenda at the end. One is the calendar. We don't do anything. We don't take any action on our agenda on the calendar of city events. We'll keep it in there so you can see it, but we don't do anything to it. So taking it off, I think we should take it off our agenda as a standing item. The other item I'd take off as a standing item is, is our aviation noise update. We found by looking back over, over 30 meetings, we had three aviation noise updates in 30 meetings. And I think we would, would we could still put it under put it under my comments as uh, just like we have with proposed agenda structure changes like tonight as a special report if we have something to report so we'll still pay attention to it but as a standing item on our agenda uh, we won't uh, I'm proposing we not have that uh, the final change that I'm proposing is to take the take the donations uh, uh, items out of our consent agenda. We always talk about them anyway, because uh, we want to bring attention to them. We want to thank the people that are donating and and we might as well take them out and let's just act on it as a, as an item kind of outside of consent. Uh, then we can just do the consent agenda. It can be approved and done and then we'll move on to that and we'll talk about the items in there and, and you all can 
um, raise them and ask questions about the donations piece. And that's it, really. It's just a it's a pretty simple set of four changes. Um, and I, I've talked about them with the mayor already because a couple of them uh, impact uh, the way that he runs the meeting, and he's good with those. And so, if there's uh, if that seems like a reasonable thing to do, we'll start. We'll restructure those agendas uh, starting next meeting. Good thoughts, questions. And that sounds good. And, and that's all I've got. That's all I have tonight, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. I just saw a couple other things here. Uh, early on, we have this um, economic report from IHS Market. Uh, they've been doing it for the U.S. Conference of Mayors for many years. Uh, and they give this uh, inflation uh, prediction. And so they're they're saying that in uh, 2022, inflation is going to fall to 4.2%. And then in 2023, inflation will return to uh, its normal, uh, it's, it's, it's pre-pandemic levels. Um, and that the, uh, you know, the, the supply and demand was really the basis uh, of the inflation that they were seeing anyway. Uh, this was an interesting piece of information too. 45% of all full-time employees in the United States are presently working from home. And this could represent, represent according to them, a seismic shift uh, in so many areas involving things that we're intimately involved in, like land use and transportation and climate change. Uh, could have serious implications for small businesses, uh, office environments. Um, what are the race and equity implications of this changing environment? 2.4 million women dropped out of the workforce from February 21 to February of 22. 2.4 million women dropped out. And they're going to do a webinar on that sometime soon. So some of you that are going to the uh, uh, National League of Cities meeting may hear more about this uh, because I'm sure that that's an issue that they'll cover as well. So um, the one other thing that I wanted to just mention here was uh, I found the note I was looking for. Uh, Mitch Landrew is a former uh, mayor of New Orleans, and um, he's been asked by the president to implement the infrastructure bill. So he's been talking to all the governors across uh, the United States. He's visited with all 50 governors. Um, he said to take a look at San Antonio as a city that's set up for success because he said, here's what's coming. There's an infrastructure guidebook coming. Uh, we need to get everything that we have into our transportation improvement program in the metro area. But he said for cities, you should be inventorying lead pipes. I don't know to the extent we have lead pipes. He said because there was money coming to take care of all that lead pipe problem. Uh, you should be thinking about where you want to put electric chargers because there's all kinds of money coming on electric chargers. And you should inventory your broadband capabilities. So he said every city, every state ought to be doing those things right now to get ready for when that money starts to flow into those particular tranches where we can get some things done. So that's something for staff to think about. And I'll pass that note along to Scott. So I don't have anything further. I don't know if that triggered anything from anybody, but uh, otherwise we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Member Jackson moves. Member Pierce seconds. Second. I'm reaching for the button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Uh, Roll call, please. Kirk Ellison. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Mayor Hufflin. Aye. We stand adjourned. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Whoever won the over, you're there. Yeah, Ron's stealing my money.